Well, Nitro. Uh, oh, we should, I was neglectful to not mention the date. That is very, very important. In fact, I think I forgot to write it down for Nitro. Because 19 years ago this week is People, too, too vague. Much. February 3rd, 1997. I have to make sure I get the episode number right, too. Uh, anyway, the NWO came out for a boring 20-minute promo. Thankfully, it did not go 20 minutes. It was Hollywood Hogan, Teddy Biasi, and Vincent. And all I can think is Hogan is talking is, how much were Ted DiBiase and Vincent paid to come out and stand there? Oh, man, a lot. I know. I don't have it in front of me, but I, I got um, I got a list of what every single person was paid in this company mm-hmm. when I was doing Death of WCW. And it's not these guys. It's the guys that never appeared on the show a single time. That is true. Lady Poffo was even more outrageous. They were making but... six figures to sit at home and do nothing. Yes. But uh, Hogan was, of course, Lord knows, a great talker. And Eric Bischoff was also talking. DiBiase had zero purpose. Because he still couldn't do anything. At least Vincent, every once in a while, could take a choke stand for the giant. DiBiase couldn't do anything physical and wasn't doing anything talking. Wasn't doing any talking. He's just there. So Hogan said he had heard rumors that Roddy Piper would show up tonight. If he did, Hogan was willing to defend his title against Piper just for a chance to finish him off once and for all. It actually didn't go 20 minutes, but there you go. Ray Mendoza Jr. versus Ultimo Dragon. Okay. It's not like you didn't have any masked guys in this company. There was one of them in the match right here. Why couldn't Ray Mendoza Jr. just be Viano 4? Is that who it was? Yeah, he had a fucking IV right there, and I'm not talking like that kind of IV. I understand. He had the number four on his trunks. They made him take his mask off and come out as Ray Mendoza Jr., well, that explains why he was so awesome. It wasn't even his real name. <laughs> even better. Raymond was a junior. I could, it was immediately clear he was a veteran luchador who did a fine job keeping up with Dragon and setting up all the spots. Maybe it's because they wanted it to be a squash and they didn't want to bury Viano 4. It's the best answer I have. So Dragon won with the uh, spinning runner off the top and a bridging tiger suplex. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Thought he looked good. Fun wall lasted. Thumbs up. Thumbs up indeed. Billy Kidman versus Glacier. Larry identified Kidman as, and I quote, a victim of the power plant. <laughs> so Glacier the tonight was doing a lot less karate. Can oh. you imagine they said that a victim of the power plant? That is what that was. They had a commercial for the power plant the week prior. Yeah. This is how they were selling it. Yeah. By saying this man was a victim of it. Yes. I mean, he was if he went there. Everybody that went there was a victim. That is absolutely true. So, Glazer did a lot less karate, a lot more pro wrestling, a lot more slams and throws and stuff, and also a lot more posing for the crowd. And there was a significant backlash for this, but I think it's what he was going for. So, Kimmy gets beat up and beat up and beat up. He cuts Glazer off, stops selling everything, goes right to the top rope, and jumps into a super kick for the finish. Served him right. Well, you know, I got to say it was a great super kick. Finish looked awesome, and Kidman took a great bump. But other than that, my notes read, whoop de doo <laughs> because it was just a match. You know what this is feeling like right now? Feeling like reviewing those WCW and NWA World Championship Wrestling shows. Yeah. Just a bunch of matches. Yeah. Until we got to the main event of the show. Tell me this match. Here's the deal. I always check out the Observer for the show that we're about to review, and Dave did not give this match a very good rating. Ice Train versus La Parca. Mm-hmm. He didn't seem to like it. No. How? Well? This match, okay, let's be fair, all right? Let's be perfectly honest. All right. There was, here's what happened. There was a deal where the outsiders were going to lay out Lex Luger with pipes, okay? All right. And so, 
they cut backstage to show this. And so as they were doing that, these guys had to go to a chin lock. Now, if you remove that, this match would have been wondrous. Ice Train came down to the ring. He was so friendly. He was so filled with charisma. He danced and he sang and he did everything. He slapped hands with all the ringside fans. He was having the time of his life. Smooth and charismatic and just plain fucking awesome, this Ice Train. Most underrated wrestler of all time. So, they have a match. Him and La Parca. By the way, Larry said, getting hit by this man is like getting run over by a Mack truck. Or a train. A fucking train, maybe, you idiot. So, they're having this match. Train catches him on a high cross, which is very impressive, actually. Gave him a world's strongest slam. Gave him something resembling a jackhammer. And I figured, oh my God, if the match ends right now, this was a good match. But no. Yes. He puts him in a scissor hold on the mat. (laughs) Yes. And I was like, why the fuck are you putting this guy in a scissor hold here on the mat? Well, the answer was because they had to go backstage to Hall and Nash. So they go backstage, and they come back, and now they're in a chin lock. Because apparently they've been told, just lay on the mat till we come back from our backstage bullshit, and then you can continue their match. So they go from a chin lock to another world's strongest slam to the giant big splash and the pinfall. And then the ice train danced, and Teddy Long said... 1997 is going to be the year of the train, baby. It wasn't. We could have only hoped. But yeah, other than the time they had to go backstage and we had to get a scissor hole and a chin lock, I thought this match was great. First of all, I want I wish we had a tape of the phone call. Well, they called the park and said, yeah, we've got a... Uh, we need luchadors to work with Rey Mysterio and Ultimo Dragon, Juventud Guerrera. Would you be interested in working with Ice Train? We got this guy, Harold Hoag. Yes. That's how they described him. Harold Hoag. Why wasn't that his name? Ice Train Harold Hoag. So Ice Train... Is awesome. Was a great athlete. A huge man who could move. The leapfrog he did here. The charisma this man had. He had a lot of charisma. Can you imagine if this guy came along and was in NXT... He'd be better. Oh, my God. Vince would take one look at this guy and be like, he's going to be my next champion. That's probably true. That's probably true. Uh, He cannot sell anything. Doesn't matter. He cannot catch Parker on a dive. He got him. The the body press, he got him. Even though he stumbled. There was a a plancha to the floor where Train, he attempted to catch him using only his pecs. (laughs) Yeah. His arms. It wasn't really a catch. No. Hit me. (laughs) I'll fall down. And he didn't. He stood there and Parker went splattering on the floor. So we got the snapmare, the leg scissors. He let him out of the leg scissors. So they could do a test of strength. It was like in the middle of the match, your favorite story about Buddy Wayne when you had to match them and things weren't going right, and he just stood up and said, let's start over. Yeah. That's what they did. They did just start over. I couldn't even believe it. it and you know what? Before they went to the thing on the mat, they did all of these big moves, and Laparca kicked out. And if I recall correctly, they stood up in front of each other, and they were going to do a test of strength. Yeah. Ice train. What? Ice train and a skeleton. A literal skeleton. <laughs> yeah. Unfair. It was this I know exactly the point you're talking about because there was a point I also where I thought train's gonna hit his finish. This will be a perfectly fine TV match. Yep. And we got like eight more minutes. Yeah, it and was it weird. Kept going and was not good. Uh I wrote this was a styles class, the likes of which AJ Styles can only dream. Oh, it was great. So train so had it's a, the outsider's fault. Hit a bunch of moves and a standing splash for the win. And yes, the Outsiders had taken out Lex Luger with lead pipes. An attack that was never even shown on TV. They just said, Lex, go lay down. Holland Nash, take these pipes, stand over him, and go! All I know is I was filled with love for this match. I thought it was great. I loved it. Loved! <laughs> Oakland interviewed the Four Horsemen on the ramp. This I didn't love. No. They've just totally reset the storyline. They were bickering for months on end with no uh, no progress. They were friends for a week. Now they're bickering again. Now, we have been alerted. I didn't go back and check, but I, I'm, I'm, I presume this is true. But last week was Arn Anderson's last ever wrestling match. That apparently is He the had truth. to retire after that one, and he does his retirement later in 97. Yes. They do the public retirement, but, I mean, we weren't told that he got hurt. 
But the horsemen just come out and they start talking about how we've been through a lot. We've been plagued by injuries and disharmony. And Arn's not even there. There's no explanation for where he's at. There's no explanation that he's injured. I guess we're just supposed to know. So the whole deal now is woman and Deborah hated each other. Mm -hmm. They've dropped that. Yes. Now Jackie, Miss Jacqueline, is debuted. And so now Nancy and I guess Deborah have a common enemy. And so now they like each other and they hate woman. Or no, they hate uh, Jackie. Yes. This makes no sense. What well, makes no sense, that is all true, by the way, of what they said. So Flair goes last. As always, he calls Kevin Sullivan devil. <laughs> he explains to Kevin and everyone around the world, including the Four Horsemen, that woman had worn him out and broken his arm, and that is why he passed her off to Benoit. Yeah. What? Well, you see, Vinny... <laughs> and woman was cool with this. Yeah. And Benoit was cool with this. Somehow he was doing some sexual act yeah. using an arm. Yes. And he did it to the point where his arm broke. He suffered an injury. <laughs> it broke. And only because of this, woman ended up with Benoit. And he and woman and Benoit are all perfectly fine with this setup. <laughs> Vinny, they're, no, the, they're horsemen. Something. This goes back to just like it was just like the flare promo we saw on NWA when he said Tully's blonde was so hot she might ride Space Mountain. No fences. Yeah. It's astonishing. <laughs> Is it really? It's Ric Flair. Well, I guess so. He broke his arm. That's what he said, right? Or Am I shoulder, missing his something? shoulder, whatever it was, whatever injury he had when he had his arm in his thing for Pretty a while. Pretty sure he said an arm injury. Yeah. Do you remember when we watched that episode of... Was like, like slapping her ass with such vigor that he threw out his shoulder I like guess, Sami Zayn? I guess. Or maybe at the end he thrust his, sho- his arm in the air and tore out his shoulder. I don't have an answer. I have never hurt my shoulder or anything like that. Can someone ask Ric Flair at his podcast how he injured his arm? Fucking Nancy. Yes. To the point that he could not continue. Do you remember that episode of Wife Swap we watched with Roddy Piper and Ric Flair? Oh, and do you remember the look on Roddy Piper's face when he realized Ric Flair was alone with his wife? Yeah. Steiners versus Harlem Heat. This was the match where... Har- oh, you didn't even mention when Woman talked about how Jackie got my leftovers. That was in there too, yeah. That was yeah, the and then she did the thing that they do with Actually, their hand in their head. The, 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 the three snaps. Yeah. The, the, this is a very 90s show. The three snaps from, from uh, In Living Color. Mongo, by the way, said he saw what happened to Luger. And uh, since Luger was taken out, he was willing to take Lex's place and wrestle Jeff Jarrett tonight. What a trooper. What a trooper. He wants to kill his fucker. Yes. So Steiners versus Harlem Heat. That hasn't been reset at least. No. But it'll never end. No. I like this match. This is where we got the Faces of Fear and Street Gear along with Public Enemy who wrestled in Street Gear. <laughs> Public en- So they're having a match. It's, it's Steiners versus Booker T and Stevie Ray. And out come Ming and Barbarian. As noted... They're wearing blue jeans, boots, and white, white WCW t-shirts. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, it was the NWO era, but everybody in the company were all black. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Baby faces, heels, NWO, whatever. Not Ming and Barbarian. They have nice white t-shirts with the WCW logo on them. Not covered in mud. I was just saying, maybe they thought they'd be bleeding later. They're very, very clean. And then out come Public Enemy who also are presumably in their street clothes, which is, in fact, their gear. Yeah. Which I can imagine if I went down the road to 7-Eleven and Public Enemy was in there, they would be wearing this outfit. That is their street clothes. So I don't know if you noticed this, but the Steiners were very, very over. Oh, yeah, it was a great match. went nuts. Well, Well, great heat. Yes, there was great stuff. Scott's press land when everyone leapt to their feet. Rick just tagging in, got a standing ovation. Stevie Ray proceeded to beat Rick Steiner so hard his headgear came off. That seems like a terrible idea. I would think very hard for hitting Rick Steiner that hard ever. So Shivani is listing all the great stars in WCW on either side of the locker room, saying this is the only show where you can see all these men. And Scott got a hot tag and ran wild, and suddenly here comes all the other teams for the four-way brawl in the DQ. And the funniest thing was, 
There's a cat fight in the hallway. <laughs> I hear that. No. Sounds pretty bad. Should uh, one of us go look at that? Or There's a murder going on in the hallway. So Scott gets the hot tag. Hey. He's running wild. The faces of fear hit the ring. They attack both teams. Public enemy hits the ring. They attack both teams. As soon as a four-way brawl with all teams brawling with each other. And it ends with the faces of fear and public enemy brawling with each other up the aisle. And we are left with the Steiners and, and uh, Harlem Heat in the ring. The two teams that started the match. And they, like, they would now like to finish their match. But the referee says, no, no, no. It's a disqualification. The match is over. So they're both frustrated, but it just ends. And it may have been fun to watch, but this was this was a pointless waste of time. Did you establish peace out there? God, I love it. You just kept going. No, I didn't. They were gone when I got out there. No. But poor Witty's there, half naked. It's a good thing I didn't send you out there. I'm just <sighs> slow anywhere. Mike Stupid e- cats. Mike Enos versus Dean Malenko. What did we just talk about that I missed? The tag match. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think you missed anything. No. no. Mike Enos versus Dean Malenko. A te- technically good match that zero people Dude, in the Dude, a crowd technically cared about. boring match. Yeah. No one cared about it. Can you imagine having a boring match with Dean Malenko? It's a defeat. Who did I see that? I said made the same comment about somebody once recently. Maybe it's Roderick Strong. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, Six came out and stole the show. And also the cruiserweight belt. Neither man noticed. They kept doing moves forever, and Dean won with a small package out of nowhere. And uh, after getting his win, Dean learned his belt had been stolen. He was informed of this by Mark Curtis, who did the best playing to the back row. Yeah. <laughs> to get the message across that this belt had been stolen, he made the belt gesture across his waist with both hands in a vigorous motion. He <laughs> pointed to the floor to indicate the belt was gone. And then he held up five fingers on one hand and his other thumb to indicate it was six. <laughs> that was the best part of the whole segment. Lee Marshall did the road report. Oh, this guy. This is the second week in a row when Tony and Mike seem to legitimately laugh at his jokes. This disturbs me. And he makes his dumb weasel jokes, and it's not funny, and it's totally predictable. And You can probably guess what he's going to say halfway. Th- you, you can write down word for word what he's going to say halfway through the bit. But somehow it catches Tony and Mike off guard. And he didn't just, there's a pause, and he didn't just declares, I hate him. <laughs> and that was so much funnier than anything Lee Marshall said. Oakland interviewed the Dungeon of Doom. Oh, my God, what a crew. <laughs> we had Kevin Sullivan. Yes. Jackie. Yes. Conan. Yes. And Jimmy Hart. Yes. And Gene. And Gene. Gene's a part of this crew, as far as I'm concerned. Sullivan was happy in this promo for the first time in like six months. He explained Jackie had been with him 10 years ago and now she was back by his side. Dude, the best part of this is he is still the devil. And so he's he's in a good mood, but he's still looking very stern. And after he does his deal, well, first off, Jimmy Hart doesn't trust Jackie. No. And Gene says, says, I think you hate all women, Jimmy. And so they go to Jackie and Jacqueline says, unlike Deborah, I don't need to undergo plastic surgery to get a body like this. Yeah. And Kevin Sullivan, <laughs> I don't know if he knew this was going to happen. His eyes grow wide, <laughs> and he's trying so hard not to laugh at the most preposterous line stated, and fucking her tits are out to hear she's saying this. Yes. It was... I couldn't even believe my eyes. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. He I'll, made it through. I like when Jimmy said, women in wrestling is always bad news. He's got a point. <laughs> well, that often works, especially in this company. It very often works out badly. Uh, Jackie had her amazing line where she claimed to have never had plastic surgery. Uh, Conan promised to take care of Benoit tonight so Sullivan can take care of Jacqueline tonight. And the other thing I got, got out of this is that Gene Oakland pronounced her name Jacqueline. Yeah, that's how they pronounced With it. With the Q. Well, he did anyway. Jacqueline. Jacqueline. I also loved at the end when Sullivan goes, tell Flair that of course Nancy wore his arm out because everything about Flair is dead or worn out. Uh-huh. And Gene did the thing where he like shakes and the mic He's jumps in his hand. Yeah. 
He's made horrified. a Nelson Rockefeller comment, and the announcers tried to get away from that as quickly as possible. This is quite the segment. It was pretty amazing. Diamond Dallas Page beat Renegade. Yep. Went about two minutes. Renegade went up top. Page crossed him and hit a diamond cutter. So Page is celebrating when the outsiders appear on the stage with pipes, daring him to come take a beating. And they cut back to the ring, and Page is scurred. Let's be honest. Page was scurred. He does not know what to do, but he knows if he goes up there, those two giants with pipes are going to beat the fuck out of him. And Savage appears in the crowd. Sting appears in the crowd somewhere else. They're all staring at Paige. Paige knows he can't trust any of these people. And this is key. Rather than flee through the other side of the crowd, Paige ducks out of the ring, grabs a chair, and goes back into the ring. And while he is scurred because he's a low-life slime ball, he's going to go down fighting. So Sting leaves, which makes sense. Because the whole gimmick for Sting has been... He will fight for WCW if they show him they will fight for themselves. So that made sense. Savage, no one knows what's going on with him. So he disappears too. I got no idea why the Outsiders left. <laughs> because they were done. They had Because it was time for a commercial. But uh, they did point out, and Hina was very explicit to say, Paige, is, he was ready to fight. He was not running anywhere. He was going to go down swinging like a man. Super Kolo versus Alex Wright. Let me talk about this match. So the match starts, and it's a Styles Clash. And they botch a couple of spots, and nobody in the crowd cares one bit. It's like an indie match. Just a bunch of moves. They do a couple of dives, a couple of botches. Except, in an indie show, the promoter, in a match like this, may just send somebody out to beat their asses and end the match. (laughs) <laughs> it has happened to me. It has happened to you. Yeah. Didn't happen here. They just kept going. And they kept going and going and going. And I was starting to get really angry. And they kept going and it kept going. And they kept doing moves. And then it started to get funny. And they kept doing moves. And they did another move. 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 And Mike Tanay, of all people, starts laughing when they do another move. And finally, Alex Wright does a drop kick off the top rope. Which, if you saw this match, it was one of a million moves, and then he wins. And it was so wacky by the end that I almost went back and watched the entire match again because I could not believe what I had just seen on national television. But well, I didn't. What I got out, of, got out of this was the spot where Wright throws a drop kick in the ring, just a regular drop kick. And Kolo bumps, and he rolls to the floor, and as he's rolling, he crashes into the guardrail. And there was a fan who had been st- in the front row, and he was standing up, and Kolo crashes into him, and he falls back down into his seat. And you can see everyone has a little chuckle of this. Ha ha, it's pretty funny. So the guy decides to milk this, so he stands up, he turns his back to the ring, and he's posing, or he's laughing, I'm not quite sure. But then Alex hits Kolo again, and Kolo bonks into the fan again, and he falls down again. <laughs> yeah. Now everyone's really laughing. Let's just keep going. And then he jumped up, and he was leaning over the guardrail, hollering, spitting. I was sure he was going to rush the ring. Sadly, he did not, because I would have wanted to see Alex and Kolo beat his ass. But instead, he calmed down. And, yes, the wrestlers did 5,000 moves and right one with the missile dropkick. I mean, there was no nothing in this match other than moves. Mm-hmm. Chris Benoit beat Conan in a short match. Excuse me, they, they had a short match. Benoit and Conan did. It was go out lasted. I loved it. Conan applied a stump puller. Yeah. A cross-legged stump puller. <laughs> yeah. And then there was a spot where Benoit wanted to put him up on the top rope for a superplex. And he goes to lift him, but they mistime it. And so he goes to lift him again, and they mistime it again. And he goes to lift him again, and they mistime it a third time. And Benoit is attempting to lift him with more shoot fury each time. Yes. And finally he gets him up there, and to make up for it, he chops him as hard as he can about ten times. And then he climbs to the top rope, and he raises his arms in the air, and everybody in the building gets to their feet and goes crazy. Yeah. And I thought... I can't think of one man who could fuck up a move three times in a row 
And by the time he's done... Get it more over? He has a standing ovation. <laughs> yes. He did it! There is a lesson to be learned from this kind of thing. When, when everything looks too easy and too perfect, it seems easy. It's like when it was the same thing when Lex Luger took three or four tries to get Roadblock up on the ramp. That's the ramp. right. When he finally did it on the third time, it was the best thing ever. That's it right. It was so much better than when he just got it on the first try. He didn't give up. He just kept trying. And it was a, a feat. Clearly it, was a, clearly, it was a difficult feat. It was a feat to get Conan up on the top rope here. So, Benoit folds him up with a German suplex. He's about to hit him with the dragon suplex and win when Jacqueline comes out with a belt to threaten Nancy. So, Benoit throws Conan over the top rope. That's a DQ this week. I thought he hit Jimmy Hart for the DQ. Maybe he did. Who cares? Regardless, he ducked outside. He yanked the belt out of Jacqueline's hand. So, he's standing there in front of Nancy, and he's just you know defending her from Jackie. So, Jackie's, Jackie says, I'm going to get something under the ring. She lifts up the apron. First thing she sees, a huge light. <laughs> it was lighter under the ring than in it in WCW. She finds a water bottle, a half-filled water bottle. She chucks it at Benoit's feet. You want to know what happened? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I so do. Apparently, apparently the story is that there was supposed to be a chair under the ring. Mm-hmm. And some shithead that worked there was looking for a chair. He found one under the ring. He got it out and he went and he sat down. Mm. And so when she went to find the fucking chair, it wasn't there. But she was determined. She had to find something. Yeah. It's live. So eventually, thank God, Conan and Jimmy Hart came and dragged her away. And they Oh, so by the way, somewhere in here, someone chucked an egg right in Jackie's face. <laughs> that also happened. Uh, I remember once reading, just thinking about the water bottle, someone went to their first house show. And they're all excited. About, they're excited about everything. So they get there early. They're taking note of every single detail about what's going on. And they couldn't believe when someone uh, lifted the apron, they couldn't believe any water bottles they saw under there. So they, their notes were like, yeah, there's going to be a spot with a lot of water bottles or everyone just drinks room temperature water all day. The lesson is everyone drinks room temperature water all day. Well, yeah. It's fine. Jeff Jarrett versus Steve McMichael. Debra is trying to pull Mongo back, keep him out of the match. She did manage to pull him to a side of the ring so Jarrett could do his pre-match strut. He is going off about how no one has ever accomplished what Mongo did in football and then tried to be a wrestler. Just two years, less than two years after Lawrence Taylor wrestled. You know, this Mongo guy, he wasn't horrible. No. And the one good thing I'll say about the guy is, he only did what he was able to do. Mostly true. Which wasn't a lot. Yeah. He would hit like a back elbow. Mm-hmm. He would hit a clothesline. He would pummel men. He was a big fan of the body slam. Sure. And he's doing all this stuff, and I'm like, eh, you know, he's 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 okay. He didn't do anything too difficult. He can't hit the ropes. That's one thing. And then all of a sudden, Jarrett throws a drop kick, and Mongo is in the ring, and he gets hit with a drop kick, and he screams at the top of his lungs. He leaps backwards. He lands on the top rope. He does a gigantic flip and ends up outside the ring. Bobby Heenan screamed. Yeah. He could not believe what he had just seen. I could not believe what I just seen. That was incredible. Yes. The bump that this fucker took over the top rope for a drop kick. Mongo was an amazing athlete. He had great charisma. If he had gone into pro wrestling instead of football twenty years ago, he would have been a great pro wrestler. But you know what? You know what's weird about it is like he was a great athlete, but he had no. Whenever people say like somebody's a great athlete, it's sort of like you could be a great athlete and not have any semblance of physical athleticism. Okay, if that makes sense. Can you imagine Mongo doing yoga? Yeah. Like Mongo cannot do the splits. Well, this Mongo, yeah. I don't think Mongo can lift his arms above his head. And the funniest thing was when he took the bump over the top rope. He, his whole body, he looked like a Mongo action figure. Nothing bent. Yeah. He was completely rigid. He leaps into the air, and he lands on the top rope, and his legs, like nothing moves ever in the middle of this match till he ends up on the ground. It was like if you threw an action figure at the top rope and it bounced over the top to the floor. So he's out there, and Deborah grabs his arm, and he and Deborah are having a conversation and the result is that Mongo gets counted out. 
Now, the announcers tried to spin this as if she had been holding him back. Yeah. That is physically impossible. (laughs) He sold it like, my wife is trying to convince me not to get in the ring. And And I I want to, but I'm listening. I am conflicted. I want to kill Jeff Jarrett, but I also don't want my wife mad at me. And eventually he took the count out. He was still very frustrated. But what I did like about what they said was, the announcers were absolutely appalled and mortified that Deborah had cost her husband a win. Yeah. Not a championship, not pride, not bragging rights, a win. Because wins and losses matter. Yeah. That I loved. So there's a commercial here for Super Brawl. There was a mad scientist in his broken down lab who explained that Super Brawl would have WCW stars like Ric Flair and Lex Luger. And then he declared, it's time to kick some butt. <laughs> what was this? <laughs> I don't know. They are a very big company that should have a much better advertising department. Come on. To advertise, you need a card. <laughs> well, there is that. Roddy Piper came out for a promo, accompanied by young Colt Toombs. I thought this was the best thing on the show. It was pretty great. Colt, and when I say young, I mean six or seven years old at this point. He comes out with this promo. It's Roddy and Colt and Gene, and Roddy is drowned out by chance of his own name. Can't deny he was a huge star. He explains that WCW has offered him a title shot, and he is flattered. But I've already beaten Hogan. I got nothing left to prove. He introduces his son Colt to the world, asks Colt to say that it's an honor to be here in Memphis, Tennessee, and Colt obliges. Roddy says, any jerk can be a baby, or any jerk can have a baby, or be a baby, I guess. But it takes a man to be a father. It's time to meet for me to grow up and be a man and go home and be a dad. So no thank you for the title match. I'm going home. You know what Colt Toombs does nowadays? MMA. Yeah, he's an MMA fighter. Here he was, seven or whatever he was at this time. Just like a little kid. And they grow up. Yes. <laughs> Just remember that. Okay. They grow up and they don't forget. <laughs> so, at this point, Hogan and his buddies arrive. And Piper here was so awesome. This was one of the highlights of his career. He was phenomenally great here. Because at this point, Hogan is a dad Concerned about his young son's safety who wants nothing Roddy. more. What did I say? Hogan. Hogan. Piper is a dad who is concerned only for his young son's safety, wants nothing more than just to get out of this ring, get out of Memphis, go back to Portland, and never leave the house again. That's all he wants. I can understand that. I've, great. <laughs> I got no problem with any of that. The fans are chanting his name because they were in confrontation, but Piper is so distraught, he screams at the fans to stop cheering. And they did, because he came off that he was emotionally distraught. Piper begs Terry, I don't want any of this. I don't want, I just want to go home. That's all I want. Hogan is having none of it, because now Hogan, you see, even though he claims that he won the match and refuses to show video uh, proving otherwise, he knows he lost. He wants his win back. And I'm speaking here of both Hollywood Hulk Hogan and Terry Balea. So his his job is to come in here and go to Piper into accepting a rematch. So he demands Piper admit that Hogan had beat him like a drum. He demands Piper admit that Hogan was the icon. Piper sheepishly, reluctantly says these things if it makes him Hogan happy. Hogan says, I'm the champion, Piper, not you. And I can't believe what you're doing. You're not just hiding behind a kilt. You're not hiding behind a woman. You're hiding behind a kid. No. Piper, I want you to leave this ring and get out of my sport forever. And he steps aside, and Piper takes young Colt by the hand, and he starts to walk away. And as he's walking, Hogan knows this is his last shot. He starts smacking Piper in the head three or four times. And now Piper can take no more. So Hogan and Bischoff turn their back. Piper kneels to young Colt, looks in the eye, wipes away a tear, says, I am sorry, Colt, passes him through the ropes to some guy. I assume Piper knows who this was. Colt's the round, so it must be. 
And then Piper stands and he removes his jacket and the place is just going nuts. And my only nitpick here is that this should have been an absolute barbaric, savage beating. But when he jumped Hogan, they went the cartoon route instead and they did the big double noggin knocker spot. Yeah, but you know what? It worked. It was awesome. It worked. As he's grabbing Hogan and Bischoff by the hair and they are running in place and waving their hands around as if they are helpless. But I thought, God, if he had just laid into them with punches. Well, he's old, Vinny, and he's got a big hip at this point. There is that as well. But yeah, he grabbed both of their heads and he rears back and he had this crazed look on his face. And he held them there for a long time Mm -hmm. because, of course, they're helpless. Yeah. And And then he rams their head together. They both go down. Oh, man, it was great. He did ring it up a level when he removed his belt and he didn't whip Hogan with it. He took the buckle and went after Hogan's eye. Yeah. He was looking to blind this man. And finally, they were able to distract him and drag Hulk to safety. And Piper got on the mic and he accepted the match in San Francisco. And that was that. That was awesome. You know, Roddy was an interesting fella. He could have his days where he was just fucking out of his mind. And you don't understand a word he said. And he was just totally out to lunch. And then he had days like this where this was an Academy Award winning performance by Roddy Piper by wrestling standards. Oh, yeah. He was so great. Yes, Mr. Hogan, you're the better man. Can I go now? Mm. God, he was great. His kid was there. Man. It's always weird when you got the kid there, too. It is. Like, you explain to the kid, you know, me and Hogan are buddies. Come meet Hogan I'm backstage. sure he knew Uncle Terry pretty well. Sure he knew Uncle Terry, but then you go out there and you're, like, so good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, it's not a cartoon anymore because your dad's such a goddamn good actor in well, this scenario. yeah, there's that, yeah. But yeah, this was this was awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And hey, once again, it was kind of a boring show, but they're building up for their pay-per-view, and the best thing on the show was the build for the main event of the pay-per-view. Great. That's what it's all about. So yeah, that was awesome. We are at war! Ugh. Should I start then? Dude, please. Monday Distance Nitro. me as far as possible from Tell Me a Lie. Number 74, February 10th, 1997. <sighs> Open with Dean Malenko. Sweating again. <laughs> Dean Malenko like I put my Guerrero. hand in ice. <laughs> Dean cuts a pre-match promo saying Six had stolen his belt. He called him down and all it says, I'll teach you a wrestling lesson and a lesson in respect. So they're going 1,000 miles an hour in this match, and the Jacksonville crowd is just eating it up. And it's all running the rope spots and lucha throws. I always love that line. I'm going to teach him a wrestling lesson. You know what I mean? There was an incident. Pedro Sauer was in Italy or something. And uh, he's 56 or something like that, 57 right now. And... I don't know what happened, but some dude just went up and grabbed his daughter's ass. Oh. He beat the shit out of the guy. Thought of a wrestling lesson. He wrist-locked the guy and made him cry. And then he made him apologize to his daughter. And uh, he posted this on Facebook or something, and it said something like, gave this guy a free jujitsu lesson. That's right. <laughs> like, this guy's the man. That's right. Do not grab Pedro Sauer's daughter's ass. I'll write that you down. dumb shits. So... They're doing all this. It's cool, and it's, it, it's very uh, uh, intense, and it's high action, but it's all very technical stuff. And then Dean just grabs Eddie and throws him through the air with a German suplex, and Eddie crashes to earth, and that's the end of that. That was awesome. Six comes out. He tries to steal Eddie's U.S. belt. Eddie sees this and goes after him, and this results in Eddie getting counted out. So Six runs away. Eddie and Dean are both pissed. Eddie offers a handshake. Dean just kind of slaps his hand away, and that was the end of that. Then Dian- Man, the fastest count out ever. It was a fast count out. Mark Curtis counted so fast, I think he skipped numbers. He counted even numbers only. So Diamond Dallas Page comes out in street clothes with a folding chair. He says, I know there's a target on my chest, but I'm tired of running. If something's going to happen, I want it to happen now. And he takes a seat. Out through the crowd comes Randy Savage and Sting. And they do their deal where they, they well, they've seen Sting do it. Now it's a two-man act, but they circle him like a, like sharks. They whack his chair with uh, the bat. And they threaten to hit him. 
and they essentially bully him back into the corner. And this is key because Paige has been a not just a heel, but a particularly slimy heel for years. And he's he's done this uh, turn with the NWO here, but he's you know he, he's he has been standing up for himself and against them, but he has not necessarily picked a side. So as they've got him cowered in the corner, he's still essentially being a heel. He is being scared. He is flinching. He's showing all sense of fear. But then, despite the fear, he doesn't run away, and he stands up for himself. And you could see and hear and feel the crowd growing to love him before their eyes. And this re- this ovation started slow and built and built and built, and they were all cheering him by the end when he wasn't going anywhere. So Sting does the deal where he hands Paige the bat and gives Paige a chance to attack, and Paige doesn't. So Sting says, okay, you are on the list of men I can trust, and Sting goes to leave. Savage, however, looks a little annoyed. He yanks the bat out of pa- Paige's hands, and he and Sting leave together. That was a great segment. Very good. And then... Bobby Eaton versus Conan. This is like Battle Bowl. Or something. Just random matches. Like, who backstage thought, I got a great idea for a match. Bobby Eaton and Conan. Like, had to be a rib, right? Well, Conan came out with uh, new music without the Dungeon of Doom. All I wrote about this was he won very quickly with a rampage. Uh, that's basically what happened. A maybe 90 seconds. Total styles clash. Bobby yeah. Eaton wanted out immediately. Yeah. And luckily, they went right to the end. We're, it's amazing to watch the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express on NWA World Championship Wrestling in 1986. Mm-hmm. And then watch Bobby Eaton versus Conan in 1997. Yeah. Wow. Ron Powers was supposed to wrestle Lex Luger. Lex comes out with a giant cast on his hand, although he is still flexing his pecs and biceps a lot. Then as he's walking down the aisle, Eric Bischoff comes running in with a microphone. Dude, this was fucking ironic, too. This was not as amazing as, as the Lost My Smile speech this week, but... He's got a bad hand, mm-hmm. and they won't let him compete until a doctor clears him. Eric Bischoff is the highest-ranking executive in WCW. It is his job, he says... To protect wrestlers from their, themselves. It says, Lex, I can't let you wrestle until you get a doctor's clearance. This is like the, this was like he did an angle based off Daniel Bryan retiring the night before. Yeah. That's, that is that's exactly, honest to God what this was like. That is exactly what he felt like. It's like Eric Bischoff, 19 years ago, knew this was going to happen, and we would be reviewing the show on this day. This, this is the kind of days where I believe that maybe I really am living in a simulation. Yes. We, we mean, are in the Truman Show. So... By the way, just to throw this out there, why, if Eric Bischoff is the highest-ranking executive in WCW, why has he not been fired yet? What do you mean? He's the highest-ranking executive. So Ted Turner's not paying any attention to what's going on in the show? Ted Turner doesn't give a shit because this thing's on fire. Well, there's that. <laughs> it's just like reality. That actually is true. Everybody right. talks about why this merger killed WCW. This... Yeah. They merged, and all of a sudden this company was losing $65 million, so fucking get rid of them. Yeah. All right, that's a good point, actually. They were making money, so Bit Turner was cool. Okay, I'll buy that. But he does say, I'm leaving the country at the end of the night, so you have two hours or whatever to get doctor's clearance, or you may be on the shelf for weeks. In fact, I'm going to be out of the country. Four to six weeks, he said. So I don't know where he was going. The moon, perhaps. But he says, if you do not get my, do not get doctor's clearance in just a couple hours, you'll be out tonight. You'll be out of Super Brawl. Wow. So Luger leaves. Bischoff looks into the camera to cut a promo. This means Giant can sneak up behind him and scare him. Bischoff ran away. So Giant took Luger's place, and my first thought was, this sucks for Ron Powers. No disrespect to Lex Luger, who won many world championships, but you go from thinking, I'm going to wrestle Lex Luger too. I'm going to wrestle the Giant. Yeah. No good. It went quick. It went quick. It's actually, this looked like the Giant wrestling a miniature version of himself. Just a guy of... <laughs> Long brown hair and beard and black trunks. But uh, Giant pinned him with a choke slam. And when he called for this move, the reaction he got from the crowd, there are no more stars. I know you know that, but it's so abundantly clear to what when you watch this. You know, we've talked a lot about this. But the big show, say what you want about the guy, but goddamn, he is a great babyface 
and he is a great heel. He has been awesome at both roles. And when he came out here and he did this interview and he says, I am no normal man. I'm a fire-breathing giant. I'm not concerned about a partner. I've got one. It's Lex Luger. Lex opened the door for me when nobody else would. He has heart and intensity. And I got to ask him a question. And Luger came out and Big Show basically told him, I'm going to Super Brawl. If you can go with me, great. And if not, I'm going to beat the hell out of both of these guys. I'm going to come back with two gold belts, and I'm going to give one of them to you. What a babyface promo. Do we mention he'd have been a pro for about two years at this point? Yeah. He was a freak. A little over a year. Yeah. He was awesome. He was awesome. So, yeah, this is all great. Hulk Hogan did a t-shirt commercial. I only note this because we've been watching these, and... I'm well aware because the NWO had their their own, you know, the the announcer voice, the the kind of echoey announcer voice, and that announcer voice always said the NWO t-shirt cost $20, but here's Hulk Hogan's NWO t-shirt. It's $22. <laughs> that extra two bucks was really, uh, that helped him buy that $35 million mansion. Yes. The NWO arrived in their limo, and Bubba challenged DDP to a match at Super Bowl. High voltage versus the Steiners. You know, one thing that you also missed at Raw was Brock. Now, as you watch the show, you'll realize I didn't really miss a lot with Brock. I really didn't miss much. I didn't need to see Dean Ambrose book like a fucking moron. But at the beginning of the show, when Brock Lesnar's music hit, he gets a reaction like nobody else in this company. Yeah. Everybody... It's hard to describe, really. Nobody gets a reaction like this, but it's mostly males. It is a very kind of low, bassy pop when he first comes out. Okay. It's a bunch of dudes filled with testosterone that are so excited that some big dude's going to come out and beat some ass. Nobody is like that except Brock nowadays. They need more guys like that. It is exactly like that with the Steiners. Steiners come out here to wrestle high voltage. High fucking voltage. Who could possibly care? But everybody cared because it's the Steiners. Yeah. And they go out there, and it's not even like it's a good match. But what it is is two dudes beating the shit out of high voltage. And high voltage are big jacked up dudes. And Scott Steiner not big enough. lifts up rage over his head with ease mm-hmm. and drops him behind him. When you have two big mean dudes beating up guys it always gets over yes this is not like some mystery this is not where i want to hear some fucker go oh brian it's 2016 it's a different business times have changed people want to see some people want to see this or that fuck off two big dudes or one big dude who beats up everybody is always going to get over i don't want to hear any bullshit about how Oh, you know, fans want to see a guy struggle or this or that. No. Get a guy who's big and strong and beats the shit out of everybody and he'll get over. Garen fucking teed. That will never change as long as there's an earth. If you were not around in the 90s, didn't see much of the Steiners, they are the closest thing you would see to two Brock Lesners. Yeah. Two big, giant, scary, skilled fighters. Suplex the hell out of everyone, in fact. So, yes, Scott here, as we've noted, was well on his way to just saying, I'm going to get as big as I possibly can. Press slamming Rage, belly to belly suplexing him, just throwing him around. I like where Rage did a chop block, and I think he was legitimately trying to take the man's knee out. He hit Scott in the back of the leg so hard, right at the joint. Probably scared for his life. So, they were building up to a four way. So, Public Enemy, Harlem Heat, and the Faces of Fear all came out to watch. Giovanni's explaining, you know, that match is for the uh, top contender spot. The winner of that team is going to be the number one contender, and that's important. But also remember, if you are the number one contender for a title, you get more money when you win. How easy wow. is that? How easy is that to explain every every match is important? But most importantly, this match at the pay-per-view, even though it's not for the title itself, it's not just a stepping stone, folks. There's serious cash at stake. What a novel concept. So... Either high or voltage missed a springboard canning ball. Cannonball. <laughs> I like canning ball. Canning ball. Uh, Rick power bond him, and the Steiners won with their double team bulldog, and everyone loved them. Yep. 
The NWO comes out to take over the announce desk. Kevin Nash says, I look like Vince Neal. And he got one word in that name, and Bischoff freaked. You could see it. And he acknowledged, you said Vince, and I thought you were going to say something else, or whatever he said. <laughs> so they brought out Randy Anderson, the referee who'd been fired. And Randy comes out with his wife, Christy, and his children, Chase and Montana. And the gimmick was, Mr. Bischoff, I know you fired me, but these are my children. Now they're sad. Please give me my job back. This is not the first time a man's been fired. <laughs> I'd wager this wouldn't work ever in any scenario, under yeah. any circumstances. So the outsiders are making tiny Tim jokes and... Bischoff is burying the kids, and finally he says, look, uh, Anderson, next week, if you can beat Nick Patrick in a match, I'll give you your job back. And Christy Anderson, who was no Deborah McMichael, says, no, you know what the doctor said. And Anderson says, I have wrestled cancer. I can wrestle you, Nick Patrick, and he leaves. And I thought, when did this cancer thing come up? This is new. I'm no. sure he actually had it. No, it's all true. I'm sure it's true. It's all true. I'm not questioning him. I'm just saying it's an odd time to randomly bring it up here. Well, what he, what he was... I mean, they had mentioned it last week. When he got fired, he would mentioned that he had did cancer. He? All right. Yeah. And so I, I did... I thought the line was awesome. I wrestled cancer. I'll wrestle him anytime. Fucking great babyface line by this referee. It is very sad that he ended up passing away of cancer. That sucks. A few years later. I didn't know that. That's terrible. And you know what? I got to say that all the times that I make fun of Wang on this show, I do have to say that he's the toughest fucker in the whole gym. That's true. Because he is the one guy that he survived leukemia. Yes. And you tell him that, and he downplays it every time. Yes, of course. Which I don't, I don't get it, but he does. <laughs> well, he didn't got... do anything. The doctors did everything. I slept through most of it. He'd rather brag about his cell phones and his watches. <laughs> he would now. rather brag about things that he hasn't actually accomplished. Yes. As opposed to things that he actually did. Yes, yes. I also like that the, the, the match they used to advertise next week's show as a hook to get you to tune in was Nick Patrick versus Randy Anderson. Yep. I loved it when, when it was over, Eric Bischoff tells Hall and Nash to go get ready because they're going to face The Extreme, Yeah, which he described as, and I quote, The Eastern Seaboard Champions. Yes. <laughs> That's a fine regional title. I thought the Texarkana television title was a funny name. The no. Eastern Seaboard yes. Champions. From Maine to like Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> also, he noted they hailed from Stamford, Connecticut. Yes. So he calls Zabisco back to do commentary with him. They do a quick squash, and the outsiders are prepared to win with their finishers. They've got them both in powerbomb position, and they say, no, 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 no. We're going to use the Giants and Lugers finishers. So, so Hall hits a choke slam. And Nash attempts to do a torture rack. Oh, my God. I well, couldn't tell if he was, m like, deliberately doing the worst rack of all time or if he really legitimately couldn't do it. He put the man on a fireman's carry. And shook. <laughs> he bent him the way your body's supposed to go. <laughs> yeah. And they beat the Eastern Seaboard champions like that. They I couldn't believe I, it. I hope they got the belts. So Six goes to interview them. He says it was a four-star match. <laughs> made me laugh. That that was funnier than a five star match. There's room for improvement here, fellas. Dude, we were watching. Uh... Go ahead, I'll find it here. Well, they're running down Luger and Giant. Uh, Nash is calling Giant a bunch of names. It says you look up Giant in the dictionary, you'll see it says like Freak and uh, something else. And he says Dork is one of the names under that is listed under Giant. And then Hall says. Like the giant, Nash is seven feet tall. But Nash stopped at the cool stage while giant passed up into the dork meter. <laughs> and this made me realize we need more promos where wrestlers call each other dorks. Oh, you did it. There you go. I knew you'd like that. Finally, you got it in the wrong way. Yes. So we're at the show last night, and uh, I'm sitting next to young Cameron, Craig's son. And there's a Charlotte versus Alicia Fox match, which was so horrible live. I don't know how it comes across on television. It was horrible live. And I turned to Cameron and I said, what do you think about this match? And he goes, this is the worst match I've ever seen. 
Now, he doesn't listen to the show. Mm -hmm. Apparently, he thought in all of his years on this earth, nine, he'd never seen a match worse than Charlotte versus Alicia Fox. That's right. And then later, I think I asked him about Adam Rose versus Titus O'Neil. And I said something like, what do you think about this match? Two stars? And he goes, one and a half. (laughs) (laughs) And Craig goes, he doesn't understand the star rating system. And I was like, actually, that is an accurate rating. Sounds good to me. So he was correct here. Didn't see it, but it sounds about right. Yeah. You know what was not one and a half stars? Rey Mysterio Jr. and Lord Stephen Regal. Well, it wasn't three stars. I'll tell you that much. This was a 10-minute draw that was over in six minutes. Well, there's that. And it was like all wrestling and Regal shaking his head. I No, this match was awesome. And it's all because of William Regal, who was great. First of all, he gets in the ring. And he sizes up Rey Mysterio as if he has never seen this man before in his life. He looks him up and down. Looks over at the ref, looks back at Ray, looks at the ref, looks at Ray, indicates the ref is in fact taller than Ray. And this is all great comedy, but he'll go through with it. So he's out grappling Ray, of course. He's it's all very, very great. And then Ray hits like two moves, like an arm drag and a drop kick. And Regal goes back to the corner and he sells it not like he is in pain. He sells it as if he has just seen a UFO. Like his brain can't process what just happened. How this small man of the mass has taken him off his feet. He proceeded to challenge the entire front row to a fight. There was a there was a group in the front row that he was fixated on all night. Yep, yep. So Ray got some offense and Regal cut him off, but now Regal's embarrassed and pissed and he attacked Ray viciously. So Regal's mindset and uh, emotional state changed throughout this match as things developed. And then you know they did the time limit draw and the finish was botched. The, uh, it went six minutes, and in fact, the bell ringer still rang it too early. <laughs> so uh. there was confusion because Ray had a pin, and the bell was ringing. And Curtis, did a, Brian Curtis did a great. Is it Mark Curtis? Oh, Brian Curtis. I think it's Mark. Yeah, Mark Curtis. Mark, Brian? Brian Hildebrand. Oh, that's his real name. Okay, I got him confused. Anyway, he did a great job. He was a great ref of uh, teasing, handing the belt to Ray, and then turning and giving it to William William Regal because it was a draw. I thought this was tremendous. Got the road report with Lee Marshall. Eh. Yeah. I don't know what to say about these anymore. Kevin Sullivan versus Maverick. <laughs> the other day, Vinny, <laughs> Brutal Bob Evans called into Observer Live. Oh, no. And during the conversation, the name Maverick Wild was brought up. Impossible. I swear to God. All right. And not only that, he goes, you'll be seeing him pretty soon on this, N- this Nitro show from the uh, mid-90s. And sure as shit, I turn on the show, and there's fucking Maverick Wild wrestling Kevin Sullivan. And he got an entrance. Yeah. Maverick Wild. First of all, Sullivan's entrance, we should note, he is a changed man now that Jackie's in his life. Because he's been either the devil, well, either the devil itself, if you ask Ric Flair, or a devil worshiper, or just a miserable human being. But now Jackie's by his side, standing taller, holding his head higher. Holds his arms out so she can take his robe off. He's a much happier man. I would be too, man. He killed the fuck out of Maverick Wild and threw Maverick Wild outside so Jackie could also beat the fuck out of him. Let me tell you how impressive it was when she beat the fuck out of him. Now, granted, he took a lot of great bumps and everything like that, yes. but at one point, she lifted him up and gave him a body slam. Mm-hmm. Now, number one, there's no way... That he was less than double her weight. Oh, easy. Easy. Maybe maybe one and a half times her weight. So that's impressive enough. And granted, you know, he helped and he went up for it and everything like that. But still, it's pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. And on top of all of that, she did this in high heels. Yes. <laughs> it's not like she was barefoot when she slammed Maverick Wild. And not only was she in high heels when she body slammed a man that weighed over twice her weight... She was wearing high heels on the black mats, which are even less stable than if she'd been doing it on the ground. This was the most impressive physical feat of the whole Monday Night Wars. It was pretty amazing. Her body slamming Maverick Wild in heels on the black mats. So she's elbowing him. She whips him in the guardrail and closed lines him. That bump he took for the clothesline was awesome. I'd imagine he got a lot of work after this match. But the other thing to remember is it's 1997. 
This is not, there was no Lucha Underground where there's men wrestling women every week. This is pre-China, even. No one had ever seen anything like this before. And these people went crazy for the woman beating up the dude. So. Because it was awesome. Yes. She slammed him. Bobby Heenan screamed. She has slammed Maverick Wild. I can tell he loved the name, too. Sullivan wins with a gut buster. A-plus squash match. We've seen a lot of squash matches lately because we're watching the old NWA shows. Very, very few of them are this good. And then we get an A-plus promo. Tanae goes to interview them, and Sullivan just takes over the whole thing. Says, this is not a wrestling interview. I am talking to two piece people, Nancy and Benoit. Says, he got a good call. He got a call from Nancy's good friend, Paul E. He dropped a lot of insider references about how he uh, couldn't risk losing his job. I had no idea what was going on by the end here. Yeah. He dropped a lot of insider references about how he could not lose a job with the top cable program in the U.S. Said Paul E. told him... All the mentors and friends of his past, like Jim Barnett and Mark Lewin and King Curtis, all of them would tell you to put the personal stuff aside and do your job. And he said, Benoit once asked him if Nancy was pure, and I said, no one, after living with me for 12 years, would pick, pick up a lot of bad habits. She knew going in, life was not going to be a bed of roses. And he and Jackie had the same line, where uh, Nancy came from a community, but they came from neighborhoods, so they were tougher. And they warned Nancy that she was going to be strapped to Jackie for the Sullivan Benoit match at Super Brawl. And if she tried to interfere, there would be hell to pay. Between that match and this promo, this may have been the best performance of Sullivan's career. Really? Yeah. I thought the promo was just. I don't want to say it was bad, but it's like, what the fuck is going on? Like, well, can we speak English here or, or something that makes sense if you're a viewer? It was, it was way too inside. This was where I felt like this show fell off a cliff. They did replay almost the whole angle from last week with Piper Hogan and Colt. Alex Wright versus Hugh Morris. <laughs> here's, here's my notes. <laughs> Wright fucks up a spot. Morris kills him. Moonsault pin. But what more is there to say? The Hooters girls they had at ringside very much interested in Alex Wright. Happy to see this man. Not after this match. And then, in contrast, out comes Hugh Morris, bare-chested and bare-gutted. And yes, Wright botched this missile dropkick to an epic degree, and Hugh said, fuck this, and he powerbombed him and moonsaulted him and pinned him. And hopefully the girls are forgiving and he would get a lot of free wings. Benoit and McMichael versus Chavo Guerrero and Jeff Jarrett. I don't know why, but the fans in Jacksonville hated Jarrett. They booed everything he did and cheered anyone who was fighting. Here's what I didn't understand. You've got Mongo McMichael we've talked about for a while here who cannot do a goddamn thing really except bump and body slam and he can't even bump very well unless it's over the top rope which somehow we can do of all the fucking guys to give a tombstone as his finish <laughs> the pile driver is banned in WWE but there are two men who are allowed to do it one is the undertaker and one is Kane Nobody else. And these shitheads thought, I got a great move for Mongo. Let's have him do a tombstone pile driver for his finish. Thankfully, he never killed anybody. But whose idea was that? I don't know. I didn't know Chavo had a lot of balls volunteering to take this move. So the finish was Deborah is distracting Jarrett by making sure the Oompa Loompa strips on his costume stay connected. <laughs> So Chavo gets pinned, Jarrett leaves in a hurry, and Flair and Anderson join the Horsemen for a promo, and for a moment, because we've talked about this, Orange Retirement's coming up, and I thought, if this is the night with Orange Retirement speech this week, I quit. No. It's too, that would be too weird to handle. No. It's not till August. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Arn says, Jar he warns Jarrett that the last guy His promo was a disaster. What did you get out of it? Um, I I can't see it. it. It was better than most where they all just bicker. They all just had random points to make. Flair essentially warns Jarrett Mongo is going to kill you. Is that what he did? Yes. I What I got out of that was it was the best delivery I've ever seen saying absolutely positively nothing. He also warned Sullivan Benoit was going was to get him. 
And then Flair went crazy for a while. Flair said nothing. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. You said Flair earlier. I'm sorry. Yes. Arn, Arn had something to say. Flair legitimately delivered four catchphrases and nothing else. Yes. Uh, Benoit noted he and Sullivan had a lot in common. Taste in women, apparently. And he said he'd win. Mongo buries the crowd in Jacksonville because Jacksonville, their football team lost in the playoffs. He said they were expansion wimps. Which made me laugh. <laughs> He then demanded to know what was up with Jarrett and Deborah. The highlight of this whole thing, and maybe the highlight of this whole show, somebody had thrown gum and gotten it stuck in Deborah's hair. Oh. So she's cutting this promo looking at the camera. I don't know if she knew it was there. I assume so, because Mongo started to try to get it out, but he couldn't get it. So she's talking, and Mongo's trying to yank this gum out of her hair. Finally, he gives up, and the cameraman realizes there's fucking gum in her hair, and the camera just zooms all the way out, so it's less obvious that she has gum in her hair. And uh, finally, Mongo's line is that the only chance Jarrett has in San Francisco is if the Earth, uh, there's another earthquake and Mongo is swallowed up. Mongo could cut a great promo. He could cut a promo. Yeah. I'll give him that. But this whole segment was a disaster. And speaking of. Roddy Piper comes out. It's time for Roddy Piper and Hulk Hogan to have a verbal debate. Oh, my God. Let me just say something. Sometimes when you do a really good angle, be done with it. Yeah. That's exactly what they should have done. Last week's angle was really good. And if they would have just recapped it this week and done a video package, there's your Super Brawl build. They trotted out Roddy here. Out of his mind. Hogan is backstage. They pretend he's via satellite from Hollywood. He's somehow in black and white, because I guess there's no color cameras in Hollywood this day. It builds up to Roddy Piper explaining that this is like the OJ trial. At the pay-per-view, he says, I'll be guilty, and you'll be finished. To which Hulk Hogan replies, that's illegal. What? At this, up to this point, he had been NWO Hollywood Hogan. But at this line, when Piper essentially threatened to murder him, Hogan yanks off his sunglasses so we can fe- see the fear in his eyes. He says, that's illegal. Is that what Roddy did? He threatened to murder him? Well, he compared himself to OJ Simpson. He talked about the trial. I didn't think he was comparing himself to OJ. What he said was, I figured, I assume the trial was still going And actually, that doesn't make sense either, because OJ was not found guilty. I think this is before the, 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 the verdict. The verdict? Yes. But he said what he said was, some people think OJ is guilty, some people think not. In San Francisco, I'll be guilty and you'll be finished. I see. Now, if that's not a threat of murder, I don't know I what guess is. that kind of is. So Hogan was right. That is illegal. Hogan says that's illegal and also murder over the line. Murder is illegal. He says that's illegal and over the line. Wow. Oh, uh, Piper also said something about Dennis Rodman. I don't know. Made some gay jokes, as he always did. There were some, there, there were some gay jokes. There was, I don't know. It was Piper, but... It sucked. It did, but it was... This is how I view everything now in this prism. <laughs> oh, yeah? This I got to hear. It was better than Roman Reigns and, just to name a guy, Seamus exchanging... Oh, well, God, dialogue. if you're going to add Seamus, that's not fair. That's illegal. <laughs> You can name That's any, over the line. You can name anyone, though. Uh, unless it's like Dean Ambrose is very good at doing their dialogue. But anyone on the roster now would have been worse doing this. Maybe not as disastrous as that he would not have involved a murderer in the promo. <laughs> but uh, from a pure entertainment standpoint, they'd have been worse. Uh, that was Nitro. Yeah, that's where it ended. <laughs> that was the end of the show. Man, I am getting to the point where I may start watching Nitro first and Raw second. Just because because Raw's the better show. Raw was better than this show. As much of a disaster as Raw was, it was better than this show. Especially the second hour of this show. Oh my god. Last half hour was it last half hour was like when we were playing Tell Me a Lie. <laughs> we are at war. All right, let's do Nitro. Nitro number seventy five. Let me read the description from the WWE network. As Roddy Piper prepares for his Super Brawl match with Hollywood Hogan in an unusual way, the Outsiders take things over the edge. Both true. And the only two highlights of the show. I can't say that. 
Rey Mysterio and were highlights? <laughs> Super Kello was a lot of fun. Nitro number 75, February 17th, 1997. The NWO arrived in two limousines. The awesome part about this was there was an A-team limousine and a B-team limousine. <laughs> of course. Vincent and Wall Street and Buff are in one and Nash and Hall and Six are in the other. And everyone gets out and then there's some sort of ruckus and the whoever was last in line had been was on the ground all of a sudden. No one quite knew what happened. Nash and Hall are looking back and forth in the darkness to see if any, they can see any clue. Turned out Big Bubble was on the ground. Tony Schiavone, trying to figure out what happened, asked, did he trip? <laughs> perhaps our, He didn't know. Perhaps a professional athlete has slipped on wet pavement and hurt his head. He was just being a professional. He didn't know what happened. This led to, well, it didn't lead to, but Rey Mysterio Jr. versus Super Kolo. Wasn't it Kolo who had a match with Conan like a month ago and killed himself over and over and over again? Do you know that I believe this guy is still wrestling? Yeah, you look this up. I remember this. Yeah. He did a drop kick off the post to the floor. Ah. He did a tope over the top rope onto Ray ah. on the floor. God. And he lived. Yeah. So here's another case on another show of too much happening at once. This match is going on. Kolo is flying around trying to kill himself on TV. Shivani announces the Steiners have been in a car wreck and would miss Super Brawl, and the Outsiders have been involved. They cut back. They have been involved. Mm-hmm. They cut backstage to see Bubba strapped to a board, loaded into an ambulance. Shivani said, "Ah, oh, you can't get hurt that bad slipping." <laughs> and Hall in the background says, and I quote, "We'll get redemption, bro." Yeah, Michael Wall Street volunteers to ride in the ambulance with Bubba to the hospital. All the NWO guys tap in the window and hold up the two sweet sign and a show of brotherhood and solidarity. Shitty heels. <laughs> what are you talking about? They were united. Yeah, they're united. They're <laughs> they're united amongst themselves. They had each other's back. Yeah, those are great heels. So there was a hundred moves. Ray hooked Kolo in something like a torture rack, believe it or not, and then hit the springboard Rana for the win. Huge pop of the finish. You could see Ray growing into a giant star. I loved Ray doing a springboard half twist into a senton, and Larry called it a two and a half gainer. <laughs> incorrect. Larry Zabisco was incorrect about something. Yeah. There you go. They also announced that Ray and Regal will be having a rematch for the television title at the upcoming pay-per-view, and it is a no-time-limit match, which makes sense based on last week's TV when they had a six-minute draw and a ten-minute title match. That's right. But that was about to change. Yeah, that's not being uh, rendered moot. WCW needed their own rock. Picked the wrong guy. <laughs> Steve and Michael versus Hugh Morris in the Battle of Hosses. Good match. It was fun while it lasted. Morris took an electric chair drop from Mongo, which is scary. And took most of the match, stopping occasionally to taunt Deborah. And finally. Pictures downloaded. Mm, good. Yeah. Deborah managed to distract the ref and simultaneously pass the briefcase to Mongo. That was slick. And Morris goes for the moonsault, but Mongo gets the briefcase up, and Mongo turns Morris over and pins him while still selling his leg. Yeah, I got to say, the guy sucked, but he could sell his leg. That's right. He did a great job. He sold it throughout the entire match. Dave, in the Observer at the time, thought Mongo really hurt his leg. Really? Yeah. Wow. Good for Mongo. That's right. Had a video package of Hulk Hogan embarrassing Roddy Piper in front of young Colt. Sad piano music really made this. Dean Malenko versus Robbie Brookside. (laughs) This was so good until the very end. Nobody cared. I'm going to be very honest, and this will make me look like an asshole. Really? But I'm going to be honest anyway. When they cut to this, this segment began, it began with a wide shot of the ring, and Malenko was about to make his entrance. So you see thousands and thousands of fans, and in the ring you see a referee and the ring announcer, and I was trying to figure out, who's that girl in the corner? (laughs) He... Robbie Brookside had long, flowing, beautiful man. hair. He had long, flowing, beautiful hair just parted down the middle, just just long. There was no texture or cut to it at all. It was just long hair. Later, in a close-up, I realized, you know what? He looks like Sebastian Buck. That's who he really looks like. Uh. So Robbie Brookside and Dean Malenko had an awesome wrestling match. I should note, actually, before that, Dean cut a promo saying they were in Tampa, and just a few miles away, his father had trained Six. And now it was time to give Six another wrestling lesson. It's a great line, and it pays off later. So they do three minutes of great chain wrestling. And it's time to go home. So Dean hits a brain buster. 
I think he was going for a cloverleaf. He was going for the Texas cloverleaf, and Robbie Brookside would not bend his <laughs> legs. Either of them. For nothing. Yes. I don't know what he thought Dean was doing. Yeah. He just wouldn't bend his legs. Dean is trying desperately to bend his legs. And finally, when he just can't get the guy's legs bent, he sort of does a sharpshooter. It was more like a, a, a cross-legged Boston crab. Kind of. <laughs> sort of. And and that's the end. And, and, and I don't know why this fell apart. And uh, Sebastian Bach tapped out. Six then cuts a promo. Calls Malenko Mr. Bland Man. He says, my respect for the Malenko family died with your father. Oh, wow. And if I had to steal this cruiserweight belt to get a shot because you've been ducking me since I came here. That was a great promo. And then Dean chased him to the back. The announcers were running down the pay-per-view card when Six and the Outsiders came to interrupt. This was so weird. So they're mad because the announcers are claiming that they were responsible for the accident that the Steiners were involved in. And they said, listen, we got a tape and we're going to show it to you. And Nash says, you know the old saying, if the accusations don't fit, you must acquit. Really? Yeah. We later learn that the outsiders have showed up. I swear to God, this is discussed on live television. They've brought us a VHS C tape. Yes. And we need a special your face right now. adapter before we can play it here on the air. <laughs> what the fuck? The largest media corporation in the world can't find a way to play this tape. I was howling, <laughs> howling when he explained the VHS C that they were going to have to find an adapter for in order to play this tape here on the air. Yeah. God. People, there's kids listening to this right now that still think we're making up that sunny download that took a half hour, <laughs> and they've never even heard of a fucking VHS C tape. Hey, I I hadn't. I knew what a camcorder tape was. I didn't know it was a VHS C. I know what it is because we used to film on them. Uh-huh. But I had a fucking adapter, and I wasn't a multi-million dollar company at the time. The other bit here was all three NWO guys were messing around with Larry, and he finally dared them to fight. And Hall tears off his T-shirt, he starts pumping his fist, saying, yeah, let's go. And then they all laughed and went away. And uh, Slow build. Yeah. And Zabisco later said it's been a while since he had seen Hall with no shirt. He quit working out. His arms are smaller than yours. <laughs> and all I can say is Larry must have seen a different Scott Hall than I saw. Because the Scott Hall that I saw still looked pretty amazing. Comedy. Amazing French Canadians versus Public Enemy. Shivani, by the way, is, <laughs> go ahead. he's trying to calm down Larry. He goes, Larry, when the second hour and you go backstage, don't go starting a fight. Just leave the building. And Larry says, I'm going to the casino. <laughs> Typical hey, old man. Nothing wrong with that. So last week, we talked about how absurd it was that the Faces of Fear were in the stands in street clothes watching yeah. the match. This time, they were in the stands, in their gear, shirtless, watching the match. <laughs> yep. <laughs> this is more absurd, I'm afraid. So, let's see. What else is there? Sherry and Harlem Heat were also in the crowd, dressed kind of like normal people. They had a decent little formula tag match. The most exciting part here was how... I should have gone back and counted how many different ways they could pronounce Willet. Yeah. There's Willet, Owlet, Alate. They had no idea how to say his name. At the end of the match, they're going to put Willette through a table. And they lay him on the table. And apparently there was a spot that was of the utmost importance. <laughs> it was very important that they had Rougeau hit Pierre before the finish. And so he gets laid on the table. They all realize they need to do this spot. I don't even fucking know why. And so they get him off the table solely so that Pierre could accidentally hit him or get hit. And then he falls on the table again and they go to the finish. Yeah. Why was this so fucking important? <laughs> I, I don't know. And then they played Public Enemy's music. Well, they won. That was great. They put him through a table, they put him in the ring, they pinned him. Yeah. They won the match. That Public Enemy music that they play on the WWE Network is amazeballs. <laughs> it's the only word I have to describe it. <laughs> Gene Oakland interviewed Dallas Page, asks him 
point blank, do you know anything about the attack on Big Bubba earlier? Paige pleads complete ignorance. What I are just, you talking about? I just got here 10 minutes ago. Just Bubba, arrived. Bubba was attacked? That's weird. He said he would never want to see anything serious happen to a fellow competitor. Gene was not buying this. Press the issue, and Paige says, I'm just here to see Pee Wee Herman and Nick Patrick. <laughs> and he left. And yes, he did say Pee Wee Herman. Prince Ikea versus William Regal. First, as Regal's coming out, Gene goes to interview him. He asks him about his world TV title defense against Rey Mysterio this Sunday. And Regal says, I am TV champion. I am willing to fight anyone, anywhere. Tonight is this young man's opportunity. Good for him. He moves on to Ray. says, if Ray was one of the seven dwarves, groovy, he would be dopey. I laughed. And he finishes up, and he's all done, and everything's fine. And he starts to walk away. Gene says, do you have any more thoughts? And Regal turns and looks back at him. Clearly, he was done. <laughs> but he steps back. He repeats the question. Always a sign that you're buying time to think of something to say. Then he says, I am slim, trim, 12 stone, or whatever the hell he said. I'm in the best shape of my life. I don't, I don't need to have any thoughts. And he walked away. What was that? Gene. Gene was bored, decided to test this man. Here is where they were talking about the adapter. <laughs> adapter. Prince Iakea, a student of the Jimmy Snuka School of po- Posing and Posturing, just doing the exact same stuff. Regal beat him up a lot, dared Ray to come out and watch, and Ray did. So Regal caused his own distraction. That is a new one. And they did the Ted DiBiase, Sean Waltman, 123 Kid, arrogant cover finish. And Iakea created him to win the match in the title. Shivani counted out the three. Long before the referee did. And so Ayaki is the new TV champ, and they sent out Teddy Long, Public Enemy, and Eddie Guerrero out there to party with Prince. And yes, this whole thing came off as a complete ripoff of Rock's win over Hunter on Raw. Yeah. It was good, though. The place went nuts for it. Yeah. They they got their title change. They went crazy. Pretty cool little upset. It's... But yeah, it was Prince Ayakea. Yes. He did not get over, like... Dwayne Johnson. No, it turns out he was not as talented as Dwayne Johnson. Nick Patrick versus Randy Anderson. I got to talk about this. This was gold. This Every Nick Patrick was awesome, Randy Anderson was awesome, and this fella Jimmy Jett. Everybody was awesome. Jimmy Jett's the referee. Anderson comes out, Pee Wee Anderson, or Pee Wee Herman as DDP called him. And Jimmy Jett is patting him down and he hands him. I must go back. I must... You're missing greatness already. What are you talking about? Patrick comes out. He's wearing the for the WCW refs. If you if you don't know, they wore black slacks, a powder blue shirt, and yes. a black bow tie, which is what the same thing Randy Anderson was wearing here to compete. Patrick comes out. He's wearing a uh, black slacks. He has the black and white like an NFL referee shirt. Yes, with the sleeves cut off, and it's way too tight. Which <laughs> yeah. is for him perfect. And he's looking at the camera, vowing to make Anderson's wife and children cry. Now, Jimmy Jed is not wearing a referee's outfit. He's wearing a white shirt. Yeah. I don't know why. I guess so we knew who the referee was. <laughs> it was important. So, yes, he checks Nick Patrick for weapons, and then he goes to check Anderson for weapons, and he checks his feet, and he checks his belt, and then he reaches into his own pocket, he pulls out a gimmick, puts it in Anderson's hand, and gives him a big wink. <laughs> Just in case he didn't get the message. They were in cahoots. They were. And God, Randy Anderson trying to hide the knucks oh, yeah. as he stood sideways. Oh, yeah. So Patrick does some shadow boxing. He is such a great heel. He is so awesome. He's laughing about how easy this is going to be. He steps back and starts to windmill up for a big punch like Daffy Duck or something. He's windmilling and windmilling and windmilling. And he takes one step forward and Anderson whacks him with a gimmick for the pin. Patrick is dead. This was perfect. Place goes crazy. Bischoff storms out. He cuts a promo on Anderson and Jet. Completely unconcerned over Nick Patrick's prone body in the ring. Stepping right over him. Doesn't check to see if he's breathing even. He says, Anderson, you're not getting your job back. Jimmy Jet, you are fired too. He berates them both for a solid minute. Then he goes back to the ring. Patrick hasn't moved. Dead man's pose now for like three minutes. He raises Patrick's arm. 
attempts to get dragged into his feet. Patrick's still dead. He tries to drag Patrick's limp body over the ropes. Patrick is still dead. Eventually, he just gave up and it ended. I love this segment so much. It was awesome. Everything about this in every way. It was great. Everybody was awesome in it. Lee Marshall did the road report. His joke this week was Weasel Roney. Yeah. Road Block versus Chris Benoit. I don't know how many times on this show we have seen Road Block now, but every time feels like the first time. No. <laughs> it was not the first time. You're, you've had enough of Road Block? I haven't had enough of him. I mean, it, okay, here's the thing about this match. If you're a young wrestler and you're small, which is almost all young wrestlers nowadays, you need to go back and watch Benoit versus the Roadblock to find out how a small man can believably fake beat the shit out of a much larger man. Yes. And at the same time, it was like Benoit went in there and squashed the guy. No. He gave the guy some stuff, and then he beat the shit out of him and pinned him. Yeah. God, he was unbelievable. Chris Benoit was a great pro wrestler. That is a fact. Roadblock held up his end of the bargain. That's generous. <laughs> I couldn't he, he think of a roadblock he, analogy. He, did not he was not a roadblock here. He did not blatantly fuck anything up. No. He's out there in his too tight singlet, which unlike Nick Patrick is not a good thing. Oh, come on. Dead end. It says dead end on his singlet in letters that appear to have been cut out by first graders. Dead end. Is that what it always said? I don't I know. I remember the, the things going up the legs, but I forgot. The street. He did say gimmick dead on end. his leg. So, that's not a roadblock. A roadblock and a dead end are two different things. They are. <laughs> Who made this fucking gear? Roadblock. Or his first graders. That actually would explain a lot. So, yes, uh, there was a bit where a woman slapped roadblock and he went after her, but Benoit got him instead. Actually, the other highlight, <laughs> Benoit has, it has, uh, he has roadblock up against the guardrail, beating the hell out of him, right in front of George Steinbrenner. <laughs> they did acknowledge him. It was not a mystery, but a very, very, very wealthy man was just watching Benoit beat the hell out of this guy. And then Benoit won with a headbutt. We got to see the Outsiders tape. On VHSC. On VHS. High quality. Very high quality. So, supposedly, the Outsiders were driving down the road. And, and they just happened. They Out did. of pure coincidence. Yes. They were apparently going to some show in a small podunk town. Hall is going off about how they love us in the small towns, love us in the big towns. But Six just happened to be filming when they came to the same gas station that the Steiners were at. And they hung back. They made fun of the Steiners' rental car. They buried what was probably going to be a ghetto hotel the Steiners were staying at. And they followed them down the road. <laughs> they followed them. And for a while, this is actually really, really funny because the Steiners were running every stop sign they saw <laughs> doing the California stop. <laughs> and the outsiders are pointing it out. Yeah. That was not a complete stop. Yeah. And Nash said, this is how you do it. And he puts on the brakes. He looks to his left. He looks to his right and says, now it is safe to go. And he drives ahead. And at this point, they had clearly been better drivers. Then things get wacky. You know what was amazing about this is at the end, the Steiners are driven off the road. And their car flies in the air and does a barrel roll and crashes, and they're dead. Clearly a stunt driver and a special effect. Mm -hmm. Before that, however... Yes. <laughs> they were... They ram into the back of the Steiner's car. Then they both speed up, and Rick or Scott starts throwing beer cans at him. Yeah. Something I've experienced. Yes. I thank Buddy Wayne for that. And then... The Outsiders drive up on the other side, and they're, like, yelling at each other, and Rick is looking out the window and screaming at him. And I'm like, they're lucky no one really died here. Kevin Nash and Rick Steiner were legitimately driving vehicles down the road, bouncing into each other, swerving in front of each other, back and forth. No stunt drivers. No, that, that part was, was all real. And at the last second, the camera gets a little shaky, there's an obvious edit, <laughs> and the, car, the big rollover crash was not Rick Steiner driving in the car. He's May as well have been. <laughs> <laughs> After everything else they did, here. it was there was the, the stuff they did was nuts. So the Steiner's car comes to a stop on its roof. The outsiders are silent for a minute. The order six to stop recording. They see there's no cops. They get the hell out of there. So even though on tape they are caught explaining that they fear police incarceration, they still presented this tape on live TV or well, yeah, on live TV. Yeah, as evidence they had done nothing wrong. They show this tape and they show the barrel roll and they show the apparent death of the Steiners. 
And they go back to the announcers, and Tony Schiavone is just staring at the camera. And then he looks over at the other guys. And then he just stands up and goes, thanks for the tape. (laughs) This is a criminal act. And he's right. The other great thing. What do these dumb shits provide this tape for? I don't know. (laughs) The other great thing Tony said here, quote, I can't believe that a company as big as this can't get an update on the Steiner's condition. Hey, they didn't even have a fucking adapter for a VHSC. Why do they know the Steiner's condition? There's more on that. Oakland interviewed Kevin Sullivan, Jimmy Hart, and Jacqueline. That was a great video, by the way. The Steiner's one? Very, very well done. Yes. So Kevin Sullivan, Jimmy Hart, and Jacqueline have decided (laughs) their new catchphrase is going to be too legit to quit. Yeah. In 1997. That song came out in 1991. This would be like if a wrestler came out saying it was going to be a party in the the USA and he was going to enjoy the climb. It's that old. This led to Kevin Sullivan versus Doc. No, 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 you dumbass. How do you not even bring up the most important part of this promo? Did you watch it? Yes. Sullivan dropped a lot of Florida references because he wrestled there forever. They do this promo, and they start heading down to the ring. But as they're heading down to the ring, Gene says, Jackie, didn't you have something to say about Nancy's behind? Ah, yes. He fed her the line. Yeah. Because he must have had the script and thought, this is the funniest fucking line, and she tried to get away without saying it. Goddamn, you're not. I'm not only going to remind you, but I'm going to tell you what the line is. And Jackie suddenly remembers her line. She goes back, and she looks in the camera, and she just says, Nancy, you got a big, fat butt. And then they keep going. That was it. That was so important that Gene had to call her back. And she clearly was over the promo. Like, she didn't want to say it at this point because she'd done her thing. And so she just went out there, and she threw out the line, I swear it was largely just for Gene. I'm sure. She didn't give a shit. And what a fucking line. That was a line... Gene had to get on national television. Nancy, you got a big, fat butt. So Kevin Sullivan squashed Doc Dean. Doc Dean? Yeah. And he was out there so Jackie could lariat and slam him and suplex him. And eventually Sullivan won with a foot stomp. This, is th- this by the way, is the point in watching these two shows back-to-back where I was burned out. <laughs> I was having much of a trouble. I was having trouble reacting to anything. You know what? Now that I think about it, I wonder if Jackie had another more clever line and she forgot it. Like maybe there was supposed to be some sort of weird analogy, like maybe some Florida reference or something that would be uh, a reference to Nancy's ass without flat out saying it. And then Jackie forgot what it was and Gene tried to get it out of her. And because Jackie couldn't remember, all she could come up with just saying, you got a big fat butt. That must have been what happened. I guess. No one will ever know. They don't remember. Conan versus Eddie Guerrero. Snake explained that to Conan, Eddie was not a good representative of the Mexican people because he never lived the life of the streets. Yeah, he said Eddie was not a real Mexican. Conan is not a real Mexican. Yes. (laughs) Neither is Eddie. So there was chin locks. And so Con- this was the battle of no real Mexicans. Yeah. Conan shouted, Dungeon of Doom, and I was struggling to stay awake. Talking about the car crash with the Steiners, and Shivani said, well, it wasn't a fatality or anything like that. But we don't know. Eddie hit a frog splash, and the faces of fear attacked for the DQ. I guess they're in the Dungeon of Doom. I forgot about that. Yeah. And Chris Jericho ran out to make the save. He was overexcited and flying out of control over the place. Oh, this comeback. This had to have been the worst entering moment of Chris Jericho's entire career. He was... He didn't look good. It was like you explained with, I think it was Sid last week. He was in every portion of the ring at the same time. He was like a quantum particle (laughs) making this comeback. And it was completely random. Yeah. He jumped, he fell... He jumped again. He fell down again. Out of position on everything. It was hilarious. So this bit with Jericho saving Eddie was to build to Jericho challenging Eddie at the pay-per-view. Odd. Gene interviewed the horseman. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Flair went crazy and said nothing. 
And he said Benoit was a love machine. I was like, no, that's Eddie's other friend. Arn starts talking about WCW's heroes who are fighting back. Not Sting. Not Luger and Giant. Randy Anderson, Jimmy Jett, and Larry Zabisco. <laughs> he did save this when he noted he had a spare $100,000 lying around and Anderson could have it. Wow, what a nice guy. Yes. Mongo and Deborah ranted about Jarrett for a while. It is amazing. You have all these great promos out there, and they give Deborah like an hour. And all the other horsemen just stand there and look at her. And she's not she's bad. Mm-hmm. And she has the most heat of any of them. Yeah. Deborah said about Jackie, quote, That girl is so bow-legged in those pumps, she could not catch a pig in a ditch. <laughs> That's better than it. Nancy, you've got a big fat <laughs> I'm not butt. sure about that. Then we get to Benoit. A man not noted for his promos. A man who at one point was nicknamed Silent But Violent. This dude would not shut up. He had a lot to say. He went on and on and on, and it wasn't that good. Well, the issue, I'm sure, was that it sounded like something that Sullivan wrote for him. Probably. And he's probably like, I don't get any of this shit. I can't remember half of it. I'll do the best I can. Yeah. Struggled through it. He's going on and on and on, and then says, don't wrap me up. I'm not finished. And he goes on and on and on and on, and he stops and they leave, and it was all such a waste of time. No, Vinny. They needed to go three hours here on this show. Ah! Excuse me? <laughs> that was a wail of exasperation. Why do you do that when you've got the giant versus Johnny Swinger <laughs> and, Top, and Gun. Top Gun? Yes. I spelled it wrong. I had giant versus Johnny Swiner and Top Gun. <laughs> giant here. Wore black wristbands, which is like the tiniest little detail in the world, but it changed his whole look. I don't think he ever did it again. He won with two choke slams in less than a minute. Oh, thank God. He spray painted Hall and Nash's names on the geeks, and Oakland and Luger joined him for a promo. Luger explained he had gotten doctor's clearance to wrestle at the pay-per-view. Provided he wore a protective brace, which mm-hmm. appears to be a giant solid cast. Yes. That doesn't seem fair. He's got a fucking metal forearm. And he's got a cast on top of it? He's bionic. He found a doctor is what happened. That's true. Bischoff comes out on stage and says, no, 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 no. You had to get that released by the end of last week's show. He said, let me back up. The man in charge of WCW, the executive vice president, I believe was his official title. He said, we have deadlines. We have obligations. We can't just be making matches by the seat of our pants out here. (laughs) That was really funny. Oh, the giant pile of bullshit. Well, at the time, they had a card. <laughs> but a year later, this was ridiculous. Lex says Bischoff could not prevent him from getting his own plane ticket, his own rental car, and his own hotel room in San Francisco. And Bischoff called the giant a furball. And the baby faces chased him to the back. And threatened to fire Luger. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then. <laughs> you know what? It wasn't that bad. It's It's... No. It's just impossible to take seriously. Well, Live from Alcatraz, it it's got Roddy ridiculous Piper. in the actual pay per view when they claim that he swam yes. from Alcatraz to Super Brawl. That was ridiculous. And people say Lucha Underground's phony. This was just somehow he got into Alcatraz. He got into Alcatraz as a tourist. Well, you, I guess. you can go tour it, so that's fine. He, yeah, he they don't lock you in a goddamn cell for seven Apparently, days. Apparently, if you ask, hey, can I just stay here? You know, no one's in the cell. You might if I just hang out for a week, and I guess I'll let you if you're Roddy Piper. So he's locked in his cell. He explains, not even Taz does Alcatraz. I'm sure he meant the cartoon character, but it was still funny. He talks about fighting on the streets at age 13. This is no wrestling promo, he says. Not a wrestling promo to draw tickets. He made fun of Hogan for wearing spandex in an airport. He says, I wear a kilt, but not in airports. (laughs) He doesn't wear his gimmick outside the ring, you fucking moron. Only in prison. That's right. He was wearing it here in Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. He did cut a great promo on Hogan. A f- phony who, you know, he just wanted to go back to his family and Hogan who's not as tough as he says or as famous as he says or as important as he thinks. Hogan drew him back in. I just got whip Hogan's ass as revenge. He tossed his bed frame around and started doing push-ups on the floor and it ended. Wacky, but it was a good little promo. It was a hell of a promo. Yeah. I don't know if it would have made me want to buy the show. Mm-hmm. 
So maybe it wasn't that good a promo. Well, it was an entertaining promo. It was entertaining. In this is the main, yeah the, in the main event. Keep in mind we're in the three hour mark here. Yeah. Chris Jericho versus Jeff Jarrett in a battle of the two greatest theme songs in WCW history. Deborah came out to root for Jeff, she said. Then Mongo came out to yell at her. Jericho goes up top. Deborah climbs the stairs and begs him, don't hurt him. Then she took the ref. Mongo bonked Jarrett with a briefcase, and Jer- uh, Jericho pinned Jarrett. Right? Yeah. What a goddamn waste of time. Yeah. And then Deborah yelled at Mongo, and they left. So I talked about going into a third hour. Hogan came out, ranted about nothing. Sting and Savage came out. They left. Hogan ranted more, and it ended. Literally, there's nothing more to say about this. Oh. No. That was such a goddamn waste of time there. Was... They were just trying to get everything in there to get this Super Brawl thing over. I mean, on paper, I'm sure it was good because, all right, Hogan's going to build up the main event for the show. The Jericho Jared thing is going to build up Jared and Mongo. I mean, on paper, it was all good. But after three hours and then rushing through it, and literally, Hogan is out there ranting and they just start playing the music. Like it's the Oscars. Like the, they the, give the guy the fucking the hook. big hook, yes. Yeah. Thank God, too. He would have just gone on all night, and he had nothing to say. So, yeah, this show fell off a cliff. Looking back, I enjoyed these shows more than I thought I did at the beginning of the show. Maybe my headache has gone away a little bit. That's why I feel better. But Nitro definitely fell off a cliff there in the last hour or so. All the way up to the tape. This was good. Well, let's go. All right. <laughs> Nitro. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> Public Enemy versus the Wacky Tag Team of Steve and Michael and Jeff Jarrett. So the pay-per-view was the night before, and they showed clips. Public Enemy won a three-way tag match against uh, Harlem Heat in the Faces of Fear. And then Deborah helped Jarrett beat Mongo, and this meant Jarrett earned a spot in the Horseman, which, as Tony pointed out, made five Horsemen. So, here in this match, first of all, I am both, I, I, I have very mixed feelings about this. They never put Mongo and Johnny Grunge in the ring together. <laughs> but the story is, the ref got distracted, Mongo got the briefcase, and Mongo whacked Jarrett and Public Enemy won. Waffled him with it. Because Lord knows this storyline can't ever be done. Hey, thank God he did that, because otherwise this made no sense. Thank Why God was he- Mongo coming out here with his wife... After his wife caused him to get beat by Jeff Jarrett the night before. Well, that makes no sense either way. He was biding his time to get his revenge. I see. <laughs> I, and? I, I underestimated Mongo's devious nature. <laughs> he, sh- he explained it in his promo. He should have hit Jeff with a briefcase and then uh, opened up the briefcase and gave her divorce papers. Word. Obviously, she has something for Jarrett. It's been pretty clear for a while now. Maybe there's a prenup. Thank God he did that because it ended this match because the public enemy sucks. Well, uh, yeah, we all agree on that one. Wow. So the horsemen come out and Flair tries to make peace and Arn gives a pep talk and Mongo's bitching and at the end they're all just friends again. He didn't like this? No. I thought it was great. This dysfunctional horseman bullshit. It is the Divas Revolution before the Divas Revolution. (laughs) First off. It is Team PCB 20 years early. Dude, don't make me have you watch the whole Raw and all those segments you don't have to see, <laughs> well, fucker. Uh, fair enough. Mongo did this awesome promo. Mongo was a great promo. He explained that when a... They're like brothers, he said. We're all horsemen, now we're like brothers. And when a brother messes with you, you take him outside, you slap him around a bit, and I did that tonight. Flair says we gotta be team players. Arn says the NWO is getting stronger, the dungeon's getting stronger, and we're getting weaker. Everybody's hurt, except Mongo and Jared. So you fuckers need to shake hands and get on the same page. And Mongo says, I never said you weren't family, Jeff. I'll mess with you, but nobody else better. And they shook hands. I thought this was great. Also, to add, they said Benoit was at home recuperating because he had a knockdown drag out with Sullivan the night before. He's in the hospital. Well, let's talk about that. Yeah, when they show clips of it. By the way, who booked match number two? I want their job. Hacksaw Jim Duggan versus Galaxy. <laughs> this is Halloween. Apparently. Halloween is too wacky. Oh, it was Halloween? But, well, yeah. Oh. 
<laughs> they called him God, Galaxy. that makes it even worse, actually. Because <laughs> Halloween's awesome. I didn't know who Galaxy was. I, I knew he was a luchador. And I, all I could think was, he probably came to Nitro thinking, sure, I'm going to put somebody over, but I will get a chance to show what I can do. No. We're going to put your put you in there with a clumsy oaf who's a whole head taller than you to make you look tiny and, and not take any of your moves. You will bump and bump and bump and bump and bump. You will miss a moonsault and get punched and get pinned. And that's what happened. Let's be fair. It could have been a thousand times worse. Sure. It wasn't bad. It was just way, uh, pointless. The first, like, four or five matches of the show were pointless. Well, yeah. So You're Duggan, telling me you didn't like Hugh Morris versus Joe Gomez? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Hmm. But also, why why are they still doing the tape gimmick with Duggan? Is it why illegal? are they doing anything with Duggan? Okay, exactly. I'm going to talk about this, okay? Here we go. I actually wrote this down. All right. Because I wanted to talk about him. So Hacksaw comes out, he has a match with Galaxy, and he wins. With a stupid tape fist. Right. And at first I was like, okay, it's been two fucking years that I've seen this goddamn tape fist, and it's it never goes anywhere. Hacksaw shows up every two months, he beats someone with his tape fist, and then we don't see him for another two months. What is the fucking point? And then it hit me. It is so much better this way, because in a little while, Vince Russo is going to show up, and Vince Russo's whole thing was, everybody has to have a storyline. Everybody in the whole promotion has to have something to do. And so we ended up with this 50-50 bullshit where to make sure that everybody has something to do, everybody has to win and lose against everybody else. I would much rather Hacksaw showed up every two months, won a stupid match, and we didn't see him again for two more months, which is exactly what's been happening with him. Do you really want him in the mix? I don't want him in the mix. I've heard of him not be on the show. Well, you ain't gonna get that. So he knocks out Galaxy and pins him here. Then he shouts out Hulk Hogan's name. Then he goes to get an interview with Gene where he's calling out Hogan and saying, Terry, you know I can't beat you. <laughs> Did anyone pull him aside and say, look, uh, Jim, we like you. You're not going to main event with Hulk Hogan. It's not going to happen. Vinny, can you at least admit that this was still a pretty goddamn good promo? It was much better than anything on Raw. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't believe in the first 15 minutes of the show... Steve Mongo McMichael and Hacksaw Jim Duggan did better promos than almost everybody on the entire WWE roster in 2016. That's a sad state of affairs. Well, to be fair, we have seen Mongo was a great promo. Yes. He's, he's got a lot of good promos. We were 21 minutes and 40 seconds into the show, and I'm very specific with that because at this point they did a cr- uh, shot of the crowd. There was a young boy in there, and I. they were in Sacramento, California in 1997, and I am almost positive this was Nate Diaz. Yeah, go to Vinny's Twitter. He posted the picture. Yeah. Am I, I wrong, Craig? I said it. it's really close, but the kid didn't look stoned. So He was 12. Couldn't, I realized Nate Diaz was probably, well. Yeah, right. there you go. Kind of does. Yeah. Joe Gomez versus Hugh Morris. Here's all I wrote about. In fact, I wrote too much about this, but I will tell you all I wrote anyway. I bet you wrote more than me. Gomez got more offense than he needed to. Then Morris caught him on a leapfrog, slammed him down, and hit the moonsault to finish him off. Definitely. Yeah. I wrote, Hugh Morris wins with the moonsault. Yeah. There's nothing more to say. Yeah. They showed shots of the Benoit Sullivan match in the pay-per-view with Woman and Jacqueline both getting constantly involved. I'm pretty sure this is the match they put on the Benoit DVD, which if you obviously is not easy to get these days, but if you have it, and if you don't mind watching Chris Benoit matches, that one is awesome. And the finish was, and I will never forget this, Sullivan's laid out on a table. Benoit's going to put him through it. Jackie throws herself on top of Sullivan to save him. Benoit says, hell with this. I'm jumping onto the pile. Benoit goes flying through the air. He lands on Jackie on top of Sullivan on top of the table, and the table does not break. It looked terribly bad. In a, not, in a, not in a bad, like, sloppy way, but in, like, Oh my god, I bet they all injured themselves very badly just now. That was a storyline. And they all went down, and they were we were told all three were still in the hospital, and if you saw this spot, you would believe that. La Parca versus Ice Train. <laughs> yes. Am I the only one? <laughs> yes. Oh, come on. What tell us about how great Ice Train is. Well, I mean the match wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like the Ice Train. You didn't get to hear his music that much. Oh, I got to hear plenty. All right. It's called Rewind. I see. 
Teddy Long did an inset promo. Oh. Was, was it about Ice Train? No. Who fucking knows? It was about Jacqueline and how she should not be with Kevin Sullivan. You know, just so everybody knows that I don't think that everything back then was better than today, 95% of the WWE locker room with a bad script, pretty much everybody but JoJo, I'm pretty sure can do a better promo than Teddy Long did in this inset promo. It was horrible. And yet not nearly as bad as Goldust was on Raw. And this is Teddy Long. Yeah. So, Parker got some offense, almost entirely spin kicks and one cork- corkscrew plancha. And Train finally caught him and slammed him down, and he got the win with a standing splash. The Train Wreck. Now, I realize that he can jump really high for anyone, let alone a 300-pound man. But still, I'm going to stand here. I'm going to jump as high as I can, and I'm just going to come crashing down on top of you. Dude, that was a Warriors finish, except he was running. He was running. That- but he got half the height. <laughs> yeah, Maybe. So, yes, train one. Eddie Guerrero and Chris Jericho versus the Faces of Fear. Oh, man. You know how tough the Barbarian is? Very. Well, yes, but I don't know what elbow injury he had, but apparently he was backstage and he couldn't find a brace or a bandage that would satisfy him. He duct taped his elbow and went out there and worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, there is a match that's going to be coming up on Raw very soon. It is Shawn Michaels and Steve Austin against Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith. Shawn's first match back after losing a smile. Yeah, yeah. I love that match. I watch that match a million times. It is a match that most people don't even think of when they think of great matches of the 90s. I thought it was so great. If I would have really known what I was doing back then, I would have watched this match a thousand times. This match was wondrous. It was everything about it was awesome. Meng, when Eddie Guerrero makes a hot tag, and Meng is selling like he's not going to be taken off of his feet, and he gets a drop kick and he swings his arms and stands up, ah, and then he gets hit again and he swings his arms and goes, ah, and then he gets hit a third time and he swings his arms and goes in a full circle and starts going, ah, and crawling at the air, then falls down. Beautiful. This was a fantastic big team versus little team match. It was a classic old school pro wrestling tag team yeah, match. Because the only way the baby faces had a chance here, because they were physically just completely outmatched, but by working together, they could take these guys out one at a time. It was all about teamwork and coordination. We've said many times that the faces of fear, we did, we did not give them nearly enough credit at the time. All their offense is awesome. And of course, they're great sellers as well. And finally, the baby faces are running wild. Jericho goes to the quebrada, but Meng pulls the rape de- ropes down. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen Vinny's eyes grow wide. Meng pulls the ro- ropes down. Jericho goes flying out of the ring. I wish I would have filmed that moment. <laughs> I've never seen that before. <laughs> I've never said that before. You just stopped and your eyes grew as wide as saucers. <laughs> I, I believe you. Like someone is going to swoop in and arrest you. For saying that. For a slip of the tongue. So, (laughs) (laughs) shut up, Craig. Wow. Jericho goes flying out of the ring. Eddie goes up top. Malenko runs down, pushes Eddie off the top rope, right into a barbarian big boot for the win. You also missed the spot where they do their double team or Ming back drops. The the backdrop powerbomb combo. And he back drops Jericho and (laughs) barbarian catches him, but just barely. He was, Jericho probably saw his life flash before his eyes because he was just a little shy catching him and he almost slipped out. But of course, Barbarian's a stud and caught him. I think that happened every time they tried that spot. (laughs) He just tossed a guy and Barbarian had to catch him out of Mm -hmm. midair. This one, he almost dropped Jericho, but he caught him. It was, it could have been really ugly and I'm sure Jericho messed himself. (laughs) He may have. Juventud Guerrero versus Rey Mysterio Jr. Awesome match. Yeah, yeah. Back and forth the whole way. They did lots of big moves. They didn't do too many big moves where you got numb to it. It wasn't the Young Bucks. Everything they did looked crisp and perfect. Finally, Hoovy tries a flip dive into the ring, but Rey catches him and hits a power bomb. And then Rey follows with a springboard Rana for the win. This is great stuff. And it was matches like, not this one specifically, but matches like this 
that revolutionized pro wrestling and led to a lot of what we've seen over the last two decades. Good match. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Lee, <laughs> what the hell more do you want? They had a good wrestling match. You Lee, covered it all. Yeah, the Lee Marshall Road Report. I feel the need to catalog these because they're so dumb. Please do, because I fast forward through all of them. <laughs> so Lee's... This, this one was at another level dumb. Lee's in Atlanta. So Tosh talking about Gone with the Wind. Or as he calls it, Gone with the Weasel. And it's not enough, not enough to leave it there. He has to say that Clark Gable's famous line in that movie is, Weasels can't build a dam. Well, he he's paid! Right. <laughs> they give him money! That's the best he could do! Yeah. Now, what if he wrote his own material? I should hope he did. Or if they had a guy. I don't even know what would be worse, honestly. They should have Heenan write his own jokes for the guy. Yeah, that would have been better. That would have been much better. Pat Tanaka versus Prince Iakea. God, Tanaka was great. Tanaka using Goldberg's music will never not be funny. IK was not great. No. Why is he the television champion? Because they wanted Rock. Because Rock was the Islander who beat the snob for oh, the title, and so they had an Islander me. beat a snob for the title. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny when you think about it. It's a it's, fact. We had The Rock versus Prince, Prince IK. What could go wrong? And you know what IK's finish was? Same thing Rock used for a while. The big, old-school, babyface high cross. That's right. I also like that <laughs> Pat Tanaka is the guy with the Chinese gear and the Japanese name, and Hina mentions he's the son of Duke Kame- Kiyomuka, the great Hawaiian wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> it's wrestling. Hey. He's bipolar. Yeah. Then we got Ultimo Dragon versus Dean Malenko. Another great match. This was awesome. I know it's not, not like this is forgotten, but I was reminded in the show just how great the WCW Cruiserweight division in 1997 was. I like this better than Ray and Hoovy. I don't blame you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this was great, too. But you had Dragon and Malenko and Eddie and Jericho and Ray and Hoovy, Psychosis. And you know what was great about this? As the match was happening, all of the announcers called the action. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow. Hmm. That's novel. You mean they weren't talking about other promos and other other no. angles and nor were they yelling at each other they weren't huh. insulting each other they nor did a bickering. fight break out amongst them no interesting they didn't repeat the same there were no obscure sports references everyone knew what they were talking about yeah it was awesome so this was a uh, more of a traditional u.s style with uh dragon getting a long heat segment so there's a story going on and it actually was told throughout but dean was challenging actually was, i guess he lost the title at the pay-per-view uh, to six. The, he lost the Cruiserweight title to six when Eddie's interference backfired. So Eddie accidentally screwed Dean. So Dean is pissed. That's and why. And he's on a slow heel turn from there. Yeah, which pretty much was done by the end of this. But right. he came out earlier and interfered in Eddie's match. Here, he is wrestling very differently. He is much angrier. He's much more aggressive. He's doing a lot more kicking and punching and less just holds. And finally, he gets to the point where he's... In a normal match, he would make his comeback. He dodges the charge, he hits a big German suplex, and then he just starts choking the life out of Dragon. And the ref can barely pull him off. Sonny Ono tries to get involved. Dean throws him aside, and he goes back to choking Dragon, and he chokes him out for the five count in the DQ. The crowd groans because the DQ for kicking too much ass finish always sucks. But here, at least, it made sense and was the part of a larger storyline. So, fine. Because Dean had snapped. Dean lost his damn mind. And, and he's... Upset about losing the title. He's upset about Eddie. Mm-hmm. And there we go. Yeah. It made sense. And he cut a promo just in case anyone missed any of this. He said, Six, I have not forgotten about you, but I will deal with you and getting my title back later. Right now, I am focusing on Eddie. Eddie, you screwed me, and I'm sick of all this disrespect. I just don't care anymore. He stormed off. Man. Diamond Dallas Page versus Squire Dave Taylor. Was Dave on Safari? I don't know what was up with We've been this. having that gimmick for a while. What is this get up? The, the, the Sherlock Holmes hat. Yeah, they did it for a while. Yeah. What's his face? Parker does the same thing. No. He's the legionnaire. I see. That's different. No, this guy was on Safari. Yeah. So Paige won in a minute, or excuse me, he was he could have won in a minute, but the outsiders came out. And so Paige opted to not get the pin and tried to watch them instead so they didn't kick his ass. They distracted him. Savage came out for the back clonked Paige in the back of the head with a can of spray paint, and then this became the best Nitro ever. Some fan thought it would be a great idea to say, I'm going to go party with the NWO. Mm-hmm. I bet those guys will like me. 
And this guy hits the ring, and he tries to, like, hug Nash, and Nash is just caught off guard and doesn't move. So he goes over to Hall, and Hall grabs him and starts laying in forearms. <laughs> he's, he's, he's defending himself. He has no idea what this guy's up to. He's teaching him a lesson. Dude, the best part is he's kind of roughing him up, mm-hmm. and then Nash is kind of roughing the guy up. Savage. Savage. And fucking Savage becomes a wild Sa- beast. And for those of you who don't wide. know, Rand- and you can tell through his sunglasses. Yeah. <laughs> Randy Savage was insane, and he went over and he gave this guy a working over. And I don't know what might have happened. Nash intervened. <laughs> Nash stepped between Savage and this fan and saved the fan's life, and he threw him out of the ring, and security ran him down. By the way, I security love... calf staff. Oh, yeah. yeah. W- w- way to go, guys. Way to go. This beating lasted like a good 45 seconds before the security ran out. Even then, he was still running away from him. <sighs> yeah. Nice no idea what they're doing. We've got uh, well, one of the better fan beatings I've seen. We got three cats, all indoor cats, and the wolf was born outside. So his father must be around here somewhere. His mother is at your house. Yeah. So there is a cat uh. that every now and then we see lurking around, and. Maybe two, maybe three times, it's jumped over the fence and has looked in our downstairs sliding glass door. Right. (laughs) When Tiggy sees this other cat, she does a Randy Savage. Uh Uh-oh. Fucking every hair on her body stands up. She grows to twice her size. She hisses. She growls. She attacks the fucking sliding glass door. The cat goes running over the fence, and Tiggy takes off trying to go after the cat from inside the house. She jumps up on the counter. She jumps up. She puts her hands up on the glass. She was Randy Savage. That's what this guy looked like when that fan hit the ring. Yep. Man, why are you trying to keep the wolf away from his father? The guy just wants to check in on his son. He's a deadbeat. Yeah? So fuck him. Huh. Where was he when the wolf was stranded outside with his kin? No, maybe he feels bad, man. He wants to make amends. Deadbeat. Anyway, that's what Savage looked like. A fucking wild beast. It was awesome. So they got the fan out of the ring, and they controlled Savage, and he dropped an elbow on Paige, and they tagged him, and that was that. He literally was like a shark smelling blood. Like Jaws. Randy Savage would have been a better Jaws than Jaws. All right. (laughs) It sure was fun watching him punch this guy. That's all I, don't I know. I think the 1976 Jaws in that movie was as intimidating as Randy Savage going after this fan. I know Jaws could have spelled NWO on DDP's back because Savage could not. What did he spell? God knows what he wrote. <laughs> it's probably, was this before the fan hit the ring? Yeah. He, 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 okay, never mind. I was gonna, uh, he might have been adrenaline. writing, die! <laughs> <laughs> so they go to break. When they come back, Savage, Hall, and Nash are all still out there. They formerly welcome Savage to the club. They bring out Hogan. Hall is playing God, mean what a storyline, by the way. We haven't even talked about this. No. Yeah. Randy Savage is now a heel. He screwed Roddy Piper. Yeah. Yeah. So the story was he lost a match to Hogan. He disappeared for a while. He showed up claiming he had been blackballed and Eric Bischoff wouldn't return his calls. He started hanging out with Sting, and then he turned bad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to WCW. The, the, the closest you could get, and they didn't—they did not explain it at all. They gave zero explanation. No, and it made no sense. I mean, it wouldn't be that hard to say he gave in to Eric's wishes, and Eric signed him back. Nope, that took zero seconds. Nothing. Yeah. They just said, "Look, Savage is NWO now." Hogan comes out, says he's got a surprise for Randy and Bischoff and DiBiase, who is long past the point of being obsolete in the NWO. But they walk out with a smiling, happy Miss Elizabeth. I couldn't believe she was smiling. This is his the the, the, the big surprise for Randy is we've re, we've reunited you with your long lost love, and what a reunion this was. They did an awkward side to side hug. Mm-hmm. Randy tried to kiss the top of her head. She pulled away, and then they never acknowledged each other's existence again. <laughs> Feel the passion. Oh man, what a storyline. Yeah, and they all ran their mouths for a while. And declare that Sacramento was NWO territory. Main event was supposed to be Harlem Heat versus Giant Lex Luger. Eric Bischoff comes running out. And Shafani says, you know what's going to happen? He's going to strip Giant and Luger of the belts. 
He did. Yeah. He says, you won the Damn last it. night. <laughs> but Lex, you never got your doctor's clearance. You were not supposed to be in that match. And you hit a man with your cast. Hey, I, where the hell was Larry? Who cares? I just realized he was gone. He was in the first half of the show. He was? Yeah. Wow. You watched a whole hour of Larry Zabisco and tuned him out. (laughs) How about that? Good for me. Yeah. (laughs) I'm jealous. How the fuck did I miss that? This is one of those things that happens all the time on Raw now that I hate, where blood rivals, hated enemies, they all get in the ring for a friendly chat. So Giant's there and Luger's there and Harlem Heat's there and the NWO's, all the NWO's in the ring, and they're all just talking. No one's fists even clenched. Nope. So business. I guess so. So Bischoff says, I'm taking those titles back. And Luger says, no, 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 you're not. Unless at the next pay-per-view, you put every title on the line. Because they've got the tag belts. They've got the world championship. They've got the cruiserweight championship. I guess that's it. I was going to say, what are the belts going to be on the line here? Prince Ikea. (laughs) So he says, "All, all the belts on the line are uncensored. WCW versus NWO. And Bischoff says, fine. Why not? I got to do a show anyway. Takes the titles back. So I don't remember where this goes, but what does this mean? So it's going to be Hogan as the world champion, mm-hmm. Luger and Giant as the tag champions, and then Hogan gets a partner. So if his partner is. I don't think they did one match. I think it's Hogan defending the title in a match. Holland Nash defending the title probably against Luger and Giant again. I thought it was like all everybody was in a tag match and whoever got the pin lost their belt. If only there was a computer that you could look this well, up. Well, no, it, it's for the purposes of reviewing, it's better to talk about how confused we are. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Obviously, we could do research, but that's not, that defeats the purpose. It wasn't explained, like, no. what the hell this means. Like, if Hogan gets a partner who has no belt, mm-hmm. and that guy gets pinned, what, nothing happens? I don't know. The point is... Which I could believe in this company. The point is, they did not explain it, and the, in all likelihood, they didn't know. So then Sting comes down. The NWO parts ways so he can enter the ring. Sting looks at Lex for a while. He looks at Hogan. Hogan hugs him. Sting doesn't hug him back, but then he stands by the NWO and the show goes off the air. I have no idea what that was. <laughs> I know what it didn't lead to, but all I know is Nitro kicked Raw's ass this week. It did, but you know what? If you look at the two companies right now, Raw's undercard is such shit. As we was on evident display tonight. But they have a long-term vision. Yes. Now, granted, it got fucked up. Yes. But they got a long-term vision. WCW has this great undercard full of wondrous matches. <laughs> they have no long-term direction. Flying by the seat of their pants. One show at a time. This NWO stuff is a fucking disaster. It, it, I don't even know what's happening. It often is. So I've done a little research. Wikipedia says the main event was Team NWO. Oh, I was wrong. Kevin Nash, I said. Scott Hall, Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage with Dennis Rodman defeated Team Piper, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Chris Benoit, Steve McMichael, and Jeff Jarrett, and Team WCW. Oh, oh no. no. Lex Luger, The Giant, and Scott Steiner. <laughs> just realized the horrible, oh, God, the horrible segment that's going to be cut between now and then. Who is Piper's team? Piper's team was the Roddy horseman. Piper, Chris Benoit, Steve McMichael, and Jeff Jarrett. Team WCW was Lex Luger, the Giant, and Scott Steiner. Somebody's obviously missing there. And it said so there was three teams. Yeah, I can't wait to watch the TV. Oh god, I'm lost just hearing this match. I've forgotten. We do get we do get the legendary Roddy Piper picking his team, uh-huh. which goes down in history as one of the worst segments of all of the '90s in any TV show, <laughs> any TV show, including like Survivor. Full House. ECW. Survivor. I love Survivor. Thank forgot you. that. It wasn't on in the 90s. Wasn't? I don't think so. It started in the late 90s. But it was 99. Find out when Survivor started. Oh, for God's sakes. Oh, this is important. Everyone races to type in Survivor. <laughs> I'm Wiki- not. Survivor Wikipedia. All right. Survivor started in 1999.